Habarigani, um, Karibuni, thank you all for being with us, um, with me, with us though, because we are in community um, this morning. We're going to start thanks to Mama Patricia Rodney, who gave us the permissions to do these readings online so that we can reach more people as Baba Rodney intended. Um, we're going to start our weekly readings of uh, Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, a very important book because it awakens us Africans to what is really happening, what has caused our situation, and um, might even give us ways to, to find solutions, uh, will give us ways to find solutions. I've read the book um, and, and, and have seen uh, ways that have been suggested whether directly or not. So today we are going to start with, um, I'll start from the be beginning. Uh, the forward is written by Angela Davis. Uh, I, I love that uh, internationalism of, of the Africanness that we are connecting beyond borders to, to, to do this work. I love that the, the Rodney family did live in Tanzania, have connections there and still maintain those relations. And they're working with people like me, myself, um, Alimadi and Adesoji, who are all um, African. Um, I was born and raised in Kenya, Alimadi in Uganda, and um, Adesoji comes from Nigeria. So I'm loving the internationalism and the pan-Africanism of it all. So um, without delay, we're going to get started. I will take breaks every now and then, uh, and we'll see what we can get done each week, uh, because this is the first time I'm doing this. I'm just going to turn off this light since it's, I don't like that glare, so bear with me. And we're going to turn this one on, and I think that's good enough. It's a little dark, but it's not as bad as um, the brightness that was there before. So let's bring this light this way, maybe, so that I can see the reading as well. Okay. Um, like I said, um, again, Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa um, the book has um, six chapters in total um, and uh, a forward by Angela Davis, uh, the preface and an introduction by Vincent Hardin, Robert Hill, and Will William Strickland. So we'll start with a forward by Angela Davis. Um, and just bear with me. Let me just make sure we were going to go live on Twitter that that is up and running. Just bear with me. <laughs> Okay. With a forward by Angela right. Davis. Um, it appears that we are up and running, so all right, we can reach more people there. So, when Walter Rodney was assassinated in 1980, at the young age of 38, he had already accomplished what few scholars achieve during careers that extend considerably longer than his. The field of African history would never be the same after the publication of How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. At the same time, this meticulously researched analysis of the abiding repercussions of European colonialism on the continent of Africa had radicalized approaches to anti-racist activism throughout the world. In fact, the term scholar activist, in quotes, acquires its most vigorous meaning when it is employed to capture the generative passion that links Walter Rodney, Walter Rodney's research to his determination to rid the planet of all of the outgrowths of colonialism and slavery. Almost 40 years after his death, we certainly need such brilliant examples of what is, it means to be a resolute intellectual who recognizes that the ultimate significance of knowledge is its capacity to transform our social worlds, which is why we're reading the book, right? To transform our current situation. We have learned from Walter Rodney and those before and after him who have critically engaged with Marxism while developing historical analysis of colonialism and slavery that challenging capitalism's deeply entrenched suppositions about human nature and progress is one of the most important ta tasks of theorists and activists who set out to dismantle structures and ideologies of racism. In refuting the argument that Africa's subordination to Europe emanated from a natural propensity towards stagnation, Rodney also repudiates the ideological assumption that external intervention alone would be capable of provoking progress on the continent. 
Although colonization officially lasted only 70 years or so, which, as Rodney points out, was a relatively short period, it was during this period that colossal changes took place both in the capitalist world, in brackets, that is, in Europe and the United States, as well as in the imagined socialist world, in brackets, especially in Russia and China. Um, open quote, to mark time, close end quote, he insists, open quote, or even to move slowly while others leap ahead is virtually equivalent to going backward. Um, close quote. Um, that's uh he he gives page 271 i i um she angela davis my mistake gives 271 is where she got that quote from in how europe and the developed africa walter rodney painstakingly argues that imperialism and the various processes that bolstered colonialism created impenetrable impenetrable structural blockades to economic and thus also political and social progress on the continent Excuse the noise outside, um, our garbage truck is here to, 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 to clean up, which we appreciate. At the same time, his argument is not meant to absolve Africans of the ultimate responsibility for development. I feel extremely privileged to have been able to meet Walter Rodney during my first trip to the African continent in 1973. I mentioned this visit to Dar es Salaam because it took place shortly after the original publication of How Europe and a Developed Africa and because I witnessed firsthand for a brief period of time the revolutionary agency generated within the scholarly and activist circles surrounding him. Not only did I have the opportunity to witness lectures and discussions he organized at the University of Dar es Salaam on the relation between African liberation and global consternations of cap to capitalism, but I also visited the training camps of the MPLA, where I met Agostino Neto, and the military cadre fighting the Portuguese army. Walter Rodney's analysis reflected both a sober, well-reasoned historical investigation shaped by Marxist categories and critiques and a deep sense of the historical conjuncture defined by global revolutionary upheavals, especially by African liberation struggles at the time. And we mentioned that um, yesterday in our show, the fact that Tanzania played a big role as far as training um, the armies that were needed uh, for, for liberation of Africa. Because he was such a methodological scholar, he did not ignore gender issues, even though he wrote, wrote without the benefit of the feminist vocabularies and frameworks of analysis that were later developed. Others have pointed out that he would have no doubt given greater emphasis to these questions had he been active at a later time. Nonetheless, at several strategic junctures in the text, Rodney addresses the role of gender, and he is careful to point out that under colonialism, African women's social, religious, constitutional, and political privileges and rights disappeared while the economic exploitation continued and was often intensified. He emphasizes that the impact of colonialism on labor in Africa redefined, redefined men's work as modern, while constituting women's work as traditional or backward. Therefore, the deterioration in the status of women's work was bound up with the consequent loss of the right to set indigenous standards, standards of what work had merit and what did not. At the time that How Europe and the Developed Africa was published, black activism, at least in the United States, was influenced not only by cultural nationalist notions of intrinsic female inferiority, often fallaciously attributed to the um, African cultural practices, and I agree with that, a lot of people argue with me about that, but that's true, sorry, but also by officially sponsored attributions of a matriarchal, in other words, defective family structure to US black communities. For example, the 1965 Moynihan Report. This book was an important tool for those of us who were intent on contesting such essentialist notions of gender within black radical movements of that era. If Walter Rodney's scholarly and activist contributions exemplified what was most demanded at that particular historical moment, he was assassinated because he believed in the real possibility of radical political change, including in Guyana, his natal land. His ideas are even more valuable today at a time when capitalism has so forcibly asserted its permanency 
And when once existing organized opposing forces, not only the socialist community of nations, but also the non-aligned nations, have been virtually eliminated. Those of us who refuse to concede that global capitalism represents the planet's best future and that Africa, the former third world, are destined to remain forever and ensconced in the poverty of underdevelopment are confronted with this critical question. How can we encourage radical critiques of capitalism as integral to struggles against racism as we also advance the recognition that we cannot envision the dismantling of capitalism as long as the structures of racism remain intact. In this sense, it is up to us to follow, expand upon, and deepen Walter Rodney's legacy. Um, that was the foreword by Angela Davis. And that last sentence, that last question, that last sentence is why Kumbukeni will be doing these readings. Um, we're going to jump right into the pre preface. This book derives from a concern with the contemporary African situation. It delves into the past only because otherwise it would be impossible to understand how the present came into being and what the trends are for the near future. In the search for an understanding of what is now called underdevelopment in Africa, the limits of inquiry have had to be fixed as far apart as the 15th century on the one hand and the end of the colonial period on the other hand. Ideally, an, an analysis of underdevelopment should come even closer to the present than the end of the colonial period in the 1960s. The phenomenon of neocolonialism cries out for extensive investigation in order to formulate the strategy and tactics of African emancipation and development. This study does not go that far, but at least certain solutions are implicit in a correct historical evaluation. Just as given medical remedies are indicated or contraindicated by a correct diagnosis of a patient's condition and an accurate case history. Hopefully, the facts and interpretation that follow will make a small contribution towards reinforcing the conclusion that African development is possible only on the basis of a radical break with the international capitalist system. Let that sink with you all, which has been the principal agency of underdevelopment of Africa over the last five centuries. I will repeat that again because I highlighted that as an important note for us to take. Hopefully, the facts and interpretation that follow will make a small contribution towards reinforcing the conclusion that African development is possible only on the basis of a radical break with the international capitalist system, which has been the principal agency of underdevelopment of Africa over the last five centuries. As the reader will observe, the question of development strategy is tackled briefly in the final section by Abdul Rahman Mohamed Babu, former Minister of Economic Affairs and Development Planning in Tanzania, in Tanzania that is, who has been actively involved in fashioning policy along those lines in the Tanzanian context. It is no accident that the text as a whole has been written with Tanzania, where ex within Tanzania, where expressions of concern for development have been accompanied by considerably more positive action than in several parts of the continent. Many colleagues and comrades shared in the preparation of this work. Special thanks must go to comrades Karim Harji and Henry Mapolu of the University of Dar es Salaam who read the manuscript in a spirit of constructive criticism. But contra contrary to the fashion in most prefaces, I will not add that, in quotes, all mistakes and shortcomings are entirely, entirely my responsibility. Walter Rod Rodney is, uh, is big on this, taking responsibility, right? Uh, and there's a lesson there for us, for me too. This is sheer bourgeois, bourgeois, bourgeois subjectivism. Responsibility in matters of these sorts is always collective, especially with regard to the remedying of shortcomings. The purpose has been to try and reach Africans who wish to explore further the nature of their exploitation, rather than to satisfy the standards set by our oppressors and their spokesmen in the academic world. I will read again the reason why Walter Rodney wrote this book for us all and why it must be 
um, shared, and I and I um, beseech you all to share this with anyone you can. For those who are in Africa, um, if you can go into a room where you can project this, uh, if people cannot afford to have phones, have it in one of those uh, small restaurants, the kiosks, where you can invite community members to come and watch and listen. Uh, please do that. Share this. Walter Rodney's purpose to writing this book for us has been to try and reach Africans who wish to explore further the nature of their exploitation rather than to satisfy the standards set by our oppressors and their spokesmen in the academic world. All right, the introduction. At the outset, before anything else is written, we need openly to acknowledge how difficult it has been for us to come to terms with the undeniable fact that Walter Rodney, our brother, friend and comrade, is dead. On June, 19, on June 13, 1980, the author of this unparalleled work of historical analysis became the best known victim of a systematic campaign of assassination and other forms of ruthless repression carried out by the governing authorities of his native land, Guyana. And the film Adesoji was mentioning yesterday, Walter Rodney, What They Don't Want You To Know, speaks on this. Um, I was fortunate to watch it earlier this year at the Walter Rodney Foundation uh, conference in Atlanta. And I'm looking forward to the next conference next year. Um, and we are working with Mama Rodney to get this to New York, but it's been showing in several cities in the US and it was showing in Europe this past week during the African Film Festival. This film um, is going to show you the parties um, that played a role in the murder of uh, Walter Rodney and in stopping the awakening of Africa and in stopping the uniting of Africans, which Walter Rodney was very much um, for. So look out for that invitation when we do have uh, a date to, to um, show the film in New York uh, or elsewhere in the North Northeast. The end was predictable, for Walter had determined that the only path to true human development and liberation for the majority of the people of his country was through the transformation of their own lives in a struggle to replace and reshape the neo-colonialist government that dominated their society and prescribed their existence. However, Forbes Burnham, the president of Guyana, had made it clear on many occasions that in this struggle for the minds and hearts of the people, he knew no limits in the determination to exterminate the forces of opposition. In the opinion of many, there is no doubt that the bomb that tore away the life of Walter Rodney was the result of Banham's deadly pledge, the neo-colonialists again, the ones who look like you and I, but do the bidding of the, uh, the white uh, ruling class, colonialism. In other words, hard as his death is to accept and absorb, we must begin here, not primarily for the purposes of sentiment or political invent invective, but because no new introduction to how Europe underdeveloped Africa is possible without a serious and direct encounter with Walter Rodney, the revolutionary scholar. The scholar revolutionary, the man of great integrity and hope. For more, for more so than most books of this of its genre, this work is clearly imbued with the spirit, the intellect, and the commitment of its author. Both the man who produced the audacious and wide-ranging study before he, he was 30, and the man who moved with an unswerving integrity to, lie, to live out its implications in his relatively brief years. With Brodney, the life and the work were one, and the life drives us back to recall the essential themes of work. I like that sentence. Um, some of us think that we can separate um, things in life. The African way um, acknowledges that everything in life is a part of life. There's no separation. There's no separation between spiritual, um, political, um, physical, uh, educational, economics. It's all part of one thing. And the work to get to a future where Africa is liberated and our well-being is ensured and nurtured and maintained, we cannot separate those parts. They have to be uh, part of, uh, of, of, of everything we do, part of our being. 
In spite of its title, this is not simply a work about European oppressors and African victims. Serving primarily as a weapon to flay the exploiters and beat them at their own intellectual games. Of course, it has done yeoman service in that limited role. Rather, there is much more to this masterly survey, and at its deepest levels, it offers no easy comfort to any of us. At one point, early in the book, Rodney summarizes its basic message. I start that message. The question as to who and what is responsible for African underdevelopment can be answered at two levels. Firstly, the answer is that the operation of the imperialist system bears major responsibility for African economic retardation by draining African wealth and by making it impossible to develop more rap rapidly the resources of the continent. Secondly, one has to deal with those who manipulated the system and those who are either agents or unwitting accomplices of the said system. The capitalists of Western Europe were the ones who actively extended their exploitation from inside Europe to cover the whole of Africa. In recent times, they were joined and to some extent replaced by the capitalists from the United States. And for many years now, even the workers of those metropolitan countries have benefited from the, ex from the exploitation and underdevelopment of Africa. That's the end of that message. And that's a, that's a, a heavy message and we'll get to it because it's part of what of, of the book. And when we get there, we can break it down because there's a lot he has said there. And there's a lot of responsibility for us all to take before we continue on this journey towards African liberation. And a lot of people argue in spaces that I attend, or Africans are to blame the leadership, the corruption, but Af Walter is telling us to look at the root cause. Root meaning for that tree to die for that plant of underdevelopment of Africa to die, we must rip it off the ground from the root. We must focus on the root, not the stem and the tree and the branches and the leaves. We can see them, they're there, we acknowledge them, but for that tree to die, we have to go for the root. All this Walter supported with a profuse and creative set of precise examples from many sources periods and places. Yet, he was not satisfied to pour well-documented blows upon the oppressors, though he was a master at this activity. Got some humor. Nor did it surface to remind many of us who live in the United States that our blackness provides no exemption, exemption from our willing participation in the benefits of our country's exploitation of Africa. Woo. Let that sink with you all. Nor did it suffice to remind many of us who live in the United States that our blackness provides no exemption from our willing participation in the benefits of our country's exploitation of Africa. I have been a part of that. You have been a part of that. We have worked in organizations that continue the ex exploitation of Africa. Some of us are still working. So here is my way of, of um, making penance with that participation. I will do everything I can to support the work that is liberating Africa. Um, if you can find peace with that, do that. As I find myself out, as I find my way out of the claws of these systems that continue the exploitation of Africa, I will start the work to clear the path towards our liberation. Rather, his summary of the book's central themes concluded with words that moved beyond accusation or guilt. He said, none of these remarks are intended to remove the ultimate responsibility for development from the shoulders of Africans. Not only are there African accomplices inside the imperialist system, but every African has a responsibility to understand the system and work for its overthrow. Every single African, it is your duty to understand the system and work for its overthrow. Unlike many of us who read the write and write such words, Walter took them seriously. He knew that they were meant for him, for the children of Africa in the Caribbean and the United States of America, for Indians, Asians, and many other sufferers at the hands of European fueled underdevelopment. Indeed, he knew they were meant too for all those Europeans and Americans who claimed solidarity with the third world struggle for development and liberation. 
Rodney envisioned and worked on the assumption that the new development of Africans and other dependent peoples of the periphery would require what he called a radical brick with the international capitalist system. A courageous challenge to the failing center of the current world order. Of course, he also knew that any such brick of, or serious cont contestation, contestation would participate in and precipitate profound revolutionary changes at the center of itself. I am pausing there to say, we should not be afraid of the changes that must be taken for us to free ourselves from this system that is exploiting us. There will be changes. It won't be comfortable. We'll have to let go of a lot of things we have gotten comfortable with. But in order to get to the other side of comfort, where China now is for their revolution, we must go through that side of discomfort to get to the other side of comfort. In order for us to separate ourselves from capitalism and the exploitative systems, we'll have to give up some things. I will have, I might have, we'll have to give up my car. I will have to give up luxuries that support the exploitative system. And it's okay so that we can get to the other end. Thus, from his perspective, what was ultimately at stake, what, what was absolutely necessary, was a fundamental transformation in the ordering of the political, cultural, and economic forces that have dominated the world for almost half a millennium. This was an awesome vision, especially since Walter dared to say and believe that such a stupendous transformation must be initiated by Africans, by us, and other dwellers in the nether regions of exploitation and subordination. He's not telling us to go ask, to travel to Paris or to whatever UN gathering and beg and ask for help from Europeans. He's not telling us to partner with the Russians. He's not telling us to partner with China. He's telling us that we are the ones who are going to find solutions. Such a stupendous transformation must be initiated by Africans and other dwellers in the Nitha regions of exploitation and subordination. Nevertheless, he did not flinch from the implications of his own analysis. Instead, he continued, especially by his example, to encourage all of us to move toward a radically transformed vision of ourselves and of our capacities for changing our lives and our objective conditions. Quietly, insistently, he urged us to claim our full responsibility for engaging in the struggle for a new world order. No one could ignore Walter's work, nor question his call, for he set the example by assuming his own part of the awesome responsibility. This is why he was in Guyana in June 1980. This is why he had been there since 1974, developing the leadership of what was called the Working People's Alliance, WPA struggling to support his family, somehow finding time to carry on research, carry on research and writing on the history of the working people of his country and other parts of the Caribbean. This is why he was murdered. In the midst of our sorrow and indignation, none of us who knew Walter could honestly say that he was, we were surprised by the news of his death. For his life carried a certain consistency and integrity that could not be ignored or denied. Indeed, in his relatively brief time, certain patterns were established early. Born on March 23, 1942, Rodney grew up in Georgetown, the capital of what was then British Guyana. From the outset, he was part of a family that took transformational politics with great seriousness. His parents, especially his father, were deeply involved in the development of the People's Progressive Party, PPP. A multiracial party it was at the time the only mass political organization in the Caribbean that was opening the common people to the world of Marxists slash socialist thought, as well as raising the possibilities of alternative futures that might go beyond the mere establishment of independence within the British Commonwealth. And by the way, as I read that, I will say there's no independence within any colonial structures. So there is no independence within the British Commonwealth. None whatsoever. You're still colonized under that um, existence. So even before he entered his teens, Walter was already engaged in leafletting, attending party meetings and absorbing the thousands of hours of political discussions that went on in his home. Then when he entered Queen's College, 
the highly regarded. So he started when he was in high school. Let that sink in with you all who are saying children cannot be involved in this work. Then when he entered Queens College, the highly regarded secondary school in Georgetown, the young political activist also became one of the scholarship boys so familiar to West Indian life at the time. Bright, energetic, and articulate, he excelled in academics and sports. He broke his school record for the high jump. And when he won the coveted Guyana scholarship to the University College of the West Indies at Mona, Jamaica, the traditional path to academic prestige and distinction was open to him. In 1963, Rodney graduated with first class honors in history from UCWI and was awarded a scholarship to the University of London, where he entered the School of Oriental and African Studies to work on his doctorate in African history. Walter's political instincts and early nurturing would not allow him to settle into the safety of conventional academic life. Instead, the years in London, which is 1963 to 1966, were among the most important of his continuing political and intellectual development. He immediately became part of a study group of younger West Indians who met regularly under the guidance of the man who was then the exemplar of the revolutionary intellectual, C.L.R. James, the Trinidadian Marxist scholar, best known for his history of the Haitian Revolution, Black Jacobins, another book that I would recommend. The experience with James in the study group was a crucial supplement to Rodney's earlier exposure to the day-to-day -day life of radical Caribbean politics. And it was also an important source of grounding in intellectual reality as he moved through the sometimes surreal world of the academic community. By the time he left London for Tanzania in 1966, Rodney was prepared to write history from what he later described as a revolutionary, socialist, and people-centered perspective. Within the boundaries of an academic thesis, his excellent dis dissertation, A History of the Upper Guinea Coast, 1545 to 1800, addressed itself to the subject from that perspective. During the 1966 to 67 academic year, Walter taught history at the University College in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. I'm going to pause here for a quick break um, just because um, I need a quick break. I am fighting a cold as we speak, so I'll be right back. Um, and you can also take a break if you need. We will continue in a few minutes.
welcome back um and i have been thinking and you can all help me decide um if we want to do this for um an hour or two hours how long can you sit through me reading uh let me know the idea is to get as much covered as possible and get to the end of the book so if you all can um sit through two hours i will do my best to read as much as i can within that time um but if you prefer um short one hour weekly um recordings please do say that i, I will look out for your comments <laughs> el chuncho oh lord have mercy eight hours um yeah I am committed to the liberation of African people, but eight hours of reading, uh, yeah. Uh -uh. All right. So we are still in the introduction. In 1968, he returned to Jamaica to take a post in history at his alma mater and to develop what he planned to be a major program in African and Caribbean studies. More importantly, he wanted to test his convictions about the need for revolutionary intellectuals to remain grounded in the ongoing life of the people. Walter met with initial success in both of, his, of these endeavors, but it was precisely this success, especially in his work among the common people of the Jamaican streets, hills, and gullies, that led to a drastic foreshortening of his stay in that country. In less than a year, Rodney had come in touch with and and helped articulate the profound discontent and unrest that filled the lives of the ordinary people of Jamaica, as well as many of the university students. As they began seriously to talk and listen together, to ground with one another about the ways to organize for change, as they heard and pondered the implications of the powerful calls for black power rising in this country, it was obvious that a deep and unpredictable ferment was at work and the conserv conservative Jamaican government readily identified Walter as an undesirable foreign element. Um, the writers of the introduction are kind to call the Jamaican government conservative. I'm calling them neo-colonial Jamaican government, uh, doing the bidding of the colonial uh, white ruling class. Thus, in October 1968, while attending a black writers conference in Montreal, Walter Rodney was officially expelled from Jamaica. These people are not even brave enough to do it while you're there. Like they, they're just sneaky and cowardly. Anyway, doesn't make it better that they did it. Either way, the government action led to several days of protest in Kingston, but Rodney was kept out. It was this political activity combined with his powerful participation in the Montreal conference that first brought the 26 year old Caribbean historian to the attention of many of us in the United States. Then, following the Jamaican government's action, Walter's fellow members of the CLR James Study Group and other Caribbean activists based in London pressed Walter for the opportunity to publish some of the lectures that he had delivered in Jamaica. With that purpose in mind, they formed the B Bogle uh, Louverture Publishing uh, House and in 1969 brought out Walter's first widely read book, Groundings with my brothers, another book I would recommend. And like I said, um, with Mama Patricia's permission, uh, Patricia Rodney's permission, um, I am um, looking forward to putting out a review of that book. Walter returned to Dar es Salaam, teaching again at the university from 1969 to 1972, while Groundings was making a profound impression on many people in this country especially among those of us who were involved in the struggle for hegemony over the definitions of the black and white experience in the United States, a struggle temporarily crystallized in the black studies movement. And sometimes you don't even need to name a thing a thing. You don't need to say Pan-Africanism. You don't need to say African internationalism. You just need to act. And Walter Rodney was living in the spirit of Pan-Africanism and African internationalism, reaching out to Africans beyond borders and seeing the common um, source of our plight beyond borders. They put the borders there just to, to, to blind us. What, the way they treat us is, is the same and the way they exploit Africans is the same no matter where you go, all right? Not su surprisingly, 
It was at one of the many conferences spawned by that movement that Walter Rodney was first introduced to a major audience of Afro-Americans. In May 1970, he participated in the second annual gathering of the African Heritage Studies Association at Howard University. While one of the contributors to this introduction, Robert Hill, had already met and worked with Walter at the University of the West Indies, the Howard Conference provided the first opportunity for the other two of us. Like many persons at the conference, my first impression of this slightly built, soft-spoken, dark-skinned brother from Guyana was his capacity to speak without notes and largely without rhetor 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 rhetorical flourish for more than an hour and yet have his highly informative material so carefully and congently organized that it would have been possible to take it directly from a transcript and publish it. Eventually, we discovered that this tremendous intellectual discipline and political instinct was matched by a disciplined force of spirit, a mastery of, but not slavery to, dialectical materialism and an unflinching commitment to the collective work on behalf of the wretched of the earth. All this was insulated from self-righteousness by a dry and ready sense of humor. In other words, it was clear to us that Walter Rodney was a moral, political, and intellectual force to be reckoned with, one of Africa's most beautiful children. From the point of our first encounter, we knew that we had met a brother, teacher, and comrade. At the time of the Howard Conference, Robert Hill, Bill Strickland, and I were working with others in the development of the Institute of the Black World, an Atlanta-based center for research, publication, and advocacy. Immediately, we began to explore the Walter, with Walter some of the ways in which he might share with us in this experience in collective intellectual work. As a result, in a series of visits, he spent quiet and hurried time among us, in our homes, we all shared the company of his wife, Pat, Mama Patricia Rodney, and their lovely children, Shaka, Kanini, and Asha. As our ties were being developed and cemented, the first edition of How Europe and a Developed Africa was jointly published by Bogul Louviter and the Tanzanian Publishing House in 1972. For all those who could obtain copies of the work, it was like a mighty, uplifting gust of fresh air. Without romanticizing pre-colonial Africa, Walter had placed it in the context of human development across the globe, traced it, its real historical relationships to the colonizing forces of Europe, and suggested the path for Africa's movement toward a new life for its people and a new role in the reshaping of the world. The book immediately struck an exciting and responsive chord among many in this country. Among politically oriented black people, it played something of the same formative role as Franz Fanon's Wretched of the Earth almost a decade before. Indeed, both men were dealing with the ravages of colonialism and neocolonialism. Both were calling for a break with the exploiting, ravaging system in order to move forward and create a new order. Both were living examples of the tr transformation they de demanded. Like Fanon's seminal work, Rodney's also began from an African-Caribbean perspective, but we in the United States of America immediately recognized the global connection. Although Walter ended his primary historical analysis with the close of the 1950s, he nevertheless offered a brief, cogent, and powerful trans treatment of the contemporary role of the United States in the exploitation of Africa, implicitly warning us against our own active or passive participation in that damaging work. But there were also connections perhaps even more directly related to the Afro-American struggles in the early 1970s, especially in his treatment of colonial and neo-colonial education and its effects on the African mind and spirit. For instance, Walter wrote, in the final analysis, perhaps the most important principle of colonial education was that of capitalist individualism. Eh, there goes that indiv individualism. In Africa, both the formal school system and the informal value system of colonialism destroyed social solidarity and promoted the worst form of alienated individualism without social responsibility. <clears throat> we Afro-Americans immediately recognized that condition. Indeed, 
One of the central themes of the movement for black studies and black power had been the call for social solidarity among black people and resistance to the destructive individualism of the mainstream American way of life. For we were painfully aware of the rising alienation among our young people as they moved ever more fully into the cultural flow of mass American society with its powerful networks of formal and informal miseducation. Thus, it was natural that those of us at the Institute of the Black World, IBW, invited Walter Rodney to participate with us in two projects directly related to these concerns. The first was a contributor to a book-length monogram, Education and Black Struggle. That was organized and edited for Harvard Educational Review in 1974. His paper was on Education in Africa and Contemporary Tanzania. The second project was of a different nature. Early in 1974, Walter had received an appointment as professor and chairman of history at the University of Guyana. The appointment was considered a clear victory for Walter and his supporters, a vindication of his vision. We invited him to spend part of the summer in Atlanta with us before his return to Guyana. He spent more than a month at IBW, primarily in the development and leadership of a summer research symposium. Colleagues from other parts of the nation and from the Caribbean joined us in the venture as we experimented with models for an educational program that would provide broader scope and new alternatives for young black people in colleges and universities across the country. At the same time, in an act of vision and courage, the Howard University Press was publishing the first American edition of How Europe and a Developed Africa. The extended time that Walter spent at IBW that summer was critical to us all. It helped to crystallize much of our thinking about the role of black intellectuals in our own society and the role that IBW might play in that development. Concurrently, it provided Walter with an opportunity to explore more deeply the implications of the unique black American experience. Moreover, it brought us all into community with an exciting group of students and co-workers. And we looked forward to the many ways in which we could continue to work together with Walter in his new post at the University of Guyana. However, even before Walter left Atlanta, we had begun to receive signals that all was not well with the university appointment. By the time he arrived home, the official word was given. At the last moment, in an unprecedented move, the appointment had been canceled, apparently the result of pressure from the highest levels of government. From that point on, Walter Rodney, revolutionary scholar, began once more to dig deeply into the soil of his native land. In spite of invitations and appeals from many places, he steadfastly refused to leave Guyana on any permanent basis. He had set himself two major tasks, both consistent with his definition of his role as a black intellectual who was committed to the liberation and development of his people. Both required his presence in Guyana. The first was to develop a major multi-volume work on the history of the working people of his country. The second task, and this was all encompassing, was to immerse himself in the contemporary life of those same people and search with them to find a way to resist the power of a government that had clearly betrayed their hopes and their trust, a government that now stood in the way of their development. In other words, Walter was still trying to deal with the neo-colonial implications of how Europe underdeveloped Africa, dauntlessly carrying the search for solutions to the center of his own life and the life of his nation. All the while, especially since Pat, his wife, had all been also been denied an opportunity to work at her profession of social welfare, Walter had to find ways to feed, clothe, and house his family. I'm going to pause there and just say something. And part of this reading is that you get to, it, this is not your typical um, uh, audiobook, right? I get to jump in with my observations. Um, you get to see 
uh, how I read for myself uh, the things I emphasize. And here, um, this, this, this truth about the Walter family struggling and being um, cast out by, by the neocolonial system, the, uh, um, entities, and they're struggling to feed, clothe, and house his family. I have reached out and I recommend, and I look forward to what us as Africans building systems, financial, economic liberation systems, where we are going to be able to support our revolutionaries. Those of us who decide to choose to act despite the fear and knowing very well what, what the risks are for us as a community to come to support them. So if that mechanism was in place during this time, what we would do is we would send the funds to the Walter family so that they could feed, clothe, and house their family. We as Africans must take ownership of our well-being. It is hard for one person to, to give money to support another, right? Because of just the, the expense of it, the amount that would be needed. But if all of us, if the millions, and there are millions of Black African people in this globe, Give a dollar, that's a million dollars for one million. So we have to understand the economic liberation power we have within our community and we must use it. And my hope is that all the organizations that are working towards liberation can come together to form a piggyback, and we shouldn't call it piggyback, uh, um, a financial bank where when our revolutionaries need us, we, just, we, we we send them the money to support the work and their families. That way they can continue the work. I continue. Even though it was hard for some of us to imagine how he did it in spite of a situation of constantly heightening tension and danger, Walter managed to find time and energy to spend long hours in the Guyana National Archives and in the Caribbean Research Library at the University in Georgetown. In addition to a number of monographs, the ultimate fruit of that disciplined and sacrificial work will appear when the John Hopkins University Press publishes Walter's History of the Guyanese Working People, 1881 to 1905. He also published during this period of intensified struggle an important text, Guyanese Sugar Plantations in the Late 19th Century. Meanwhile, he continued to organize. Before 1974 was over, Walter had helped to centralize the work pe Working People's Alliance. For those of you who say, let's study, let's study and plan, and usually that is said uh, in, contra in tra contradiction to those who want to go out and organize. Walter was doing both. He was studying, he was writing, he was caring for his family, and he was organizing. So go figure. Um, this became his political base in the relentless struggle to build a force that would bring about the revolutionary transformation of the Guyanese society. With the help of many persons in the United States and other parts of the world, Walter found opportunities to lecture and teach in an attempt to keep in touch with his comrades outside of Guyana and to earn the funds his family needed. James Turner, director of the African Studies and Research Center at Cornell and Emmanuel Wallerstein of the State University of New York at Birmingham, Binghamton were especially helpful to those of us who were trying to organize these activities. Whenever Walter traveled abroad, especially as the government's repression increased, many friends urged him to leave Guyana and bring himself and his family to some place of relative safety. Walter's response to us generally had two parts. First was his sense of the responsibility he had to his comrades and the people of Guyana. He said that he was working among them to encourage them in a fearless struggle for the transformation of themselves and their society, and that he could not leave simply because he had happened to have ready access to the means of escape. Second, Rodney said he felt he had been singularly privileged in the broad set of contacts he had been able to establish in the course of his work and traveled throughout the third world. For him, this privilege carried with it a responsibility to continue to share with his people the content and spirit of that international network of women and men involved in liberation struggles. Thus, 
without any trace of a desire for martyrdom, but with a clear recognition of the situation he faced, Walter's response was always the same. It is imperative that I stay here. I welcome comments because um, if anything is standing out to you, if you have any observations on what is being said, um, just enter in the chat your comments, please. It will um, expand the conversation. And in your comments, we might have answers and solutions for the way forward. To add the end, all these dangers, hopes, and tensions were concentrated in the events of one last year-long outpouring of life and death. In June 1979, the WPA formally announced that it had transformed itself into a political party, one that would work untiringly for the overthrow of the stronghold that Barnham's People's National Congress had established in the country. In the following month, a government building in Georgetown was set afire and Walter, Walter and four other WPA members were among the eight persons arrested and charged with arson. Because it was a government building, the charge was very serious. But it was also clear to many observers that the action was entirely set up as part of the measures for breaking the force of Rodney's small but influential organization. On the day of the arraignment, Father Bernard Danke, a priest who was a reporter for the Catholic Standard, was fatally stabbed in the back as he stood observing a pro-W PA demonstration outside the courthouse. From that point on, a repressive situation deteriorated into what might be called a long night of official terrorism, including bombings, police beatings, and escalating threats of extermination by Burnham against Walter and other leaders of the opposition WPA. And let's mark that. That terrorism is by the government entities terrorizing the people, not the opposite that usually is is talked about no because what colonialism is doing is terrorism so this is what uh, is being pointed out here by the end of february 1918 two of walter's close associates in the wpa ohene kawama and edward dublin had been killed by the police others shot and beaten still others jailed their houses raided ransacked and bombed. And if that is not terrorism, I don't know what is, right? Coming from the word to terrorize. By then, some of the leading members of the WPA were actually being held as political prisoners in Guyana, for their government refused them permission to leave the country. However, Rodney managed to get out in May 1980, accepting an invitation from the Patriotic Front to intend the independence ceremony to to intend the independence ceremonies in Zimbabwe. I'm assuming that's a misprint and that's attend the independence ceremonies in Zimbabwe. Then Walter returned to Guyana, continuing to work in the archives to organize among the people. He had ominously told some of us in this country that we might not see him again. On June 2nd, the trial for arson began witnessed by concerned observers for the Carib from the Caribbean, the United States, and England. Within a few days, it was clear that the government had no case and could not prosecute Rodney and his co-workers. And I'm going to say this because there is an organization currently um, in the United States that is under attack. I'm going to say this. Just because these entities that we think are the entities of law enforcement and cannot be questioned, are accusing a certain person or a certain organization, usually African, of certain crimes does not mean it is so. And we as Africans must live and turn every lift and turn every rock to find out what the truth is. And we must critically analyze what is being done. For example, if there is an indictment that is only picking certain sentences from an email we should demand that the whole email be put out so that we for ourselves can see what was actually said and determine whether it is as they say it is. As a result, on June 6th, at the request of the government, the trial was adjourned until August 20th. One week after the adjournment, on Friday evening, June 13th, Walter was sitting in his brother's car, 
waiting for Donald Rodney at the driver's seat. They had stopped at the house of a man who we now know had infiltrated the ranks of the WPA. Donald Rodney went in to pick up what the man said was a walkie-talkie that Walter wanted. As they stood in the infiltrator's yard around 7.30 p.m., PM, he told Rodney to drive off and wait for a test signal at 8. Donald returned to the car and drove away. When the signal came, it turned out to be the explosion that ended Walter Rodney's life. A few weeks before his death, Rodney had been persistently interviewed about the dangers that he faced and his plans for defending himself against them. He said, as to my own safety and the safety of a number of other persons within the WPA, we will try to guarantee our safety by the level of political mobilization and political action inside and outside the country. Ultimately, it is this rather than any kind of physical defense which will guarantee our safety. None of us are unmindful of the threat that is constantly posed. We don't regard ourselves as adventurers, as martyrs or potential martyrs, but we think there is a job which needs to be done and at a certain point in time, we have to do what has to be done. And I'll let that sink with you all for a second. So this, you can see this in the movie that I mentioned before, Walter, Rodney, um, what they don't want you to know. This is played out in the movie, uh, very moving uh, part of the movie. But what Walter is telling us there is just because we understand there is the threat that we might be arrested, we might th be thrown in prison, we might be killed like they did others and surely did so, so that it can terrorize us and intimidate us against taking action. Just because that is a reality does not mean we don't do the work. And if I decide today that I'm no longer going to do that work to expose the colonial systems and to awaken and decolonize African minds and to organize them so that we can start uh, um, taking our well-being into our own hands and the repairing of our communities into our own hands. For example, if a certain city is declared a food desert, we start putting up uh, community gardens. We start figuring out, putting the resources towards providing food and taking that uh, uh, um, harm away from that community. We cannot stop that work. We cannot let that fear or, or reality that they will punish us, that they will uh, kill us, that they will throw us into jail, stop the work. And I cannot say, again, I was, I think that's where I was. I cannot say that, oh, I have children, oh, my family is at risk, at the, with the expectation that someone else will pick it up because the pain still continues, the oppression continues. And as long as it continues, we always want it to stop. But if we want it to stop, we have to be willing to put, put ourselves in a position where we are helping with the stopping of the oppression. We cannot wait for someone else to do so. It is selfish to do that. And this is Walter is, is what Walter is saying in so many words. Again, Walter's courageous sense of commitment and integrity evokes sharp memories of Fanon. He too sacrificed his life for the liberation of his people and died before he was 40. He too called the children of Africa and all those damned by Europe to seize the initiative and change our ways. He too asked us to resist all temptations to live out our lives as permanent victims, angry accusers of fawning imitators of Europe. It was he who said, come then comrades, the European game has finally ended. Look at them today, swaying between atomic and spiritual disintegration. We must find something different. We today can do everything so long as we do not intimate, imitate Europe, so long as we are not obsessed by the desire to catch up with Europe. We have taken the liberty at this point of changing Europe to Europe America. We think from Fanon would permit that. The third world faces Europe America like a colossal mass whose aim should be to try to resolve the problems of which Europe America has not been able to find the answers. So comrades, 
Let it not pay tribute to Europe, America, by creating states, institutions, and societies which draw their inspiration from her. And that goes to that point about calling a united Africa, United States of Africa. Um, Fanon continues, if we want humanity to advance a step further, if we want to bring it up to a different level than that which Europe America has shown it, then we must invent and we must make discoveries. If we wish to live up to our people's expectations, we must seek the response elsewhere than in Europe America. For Europe America, for ourselves and for humanity, comrades, we must turn over a new leaf. We must work out new concepts and we must try to set afoot a new man. That is Franz Fanon um, in The Wretched of the Earth, page 252 to 255. From Walter's perspective, that was the job that needs to be done. The challenge that he and his comrades had determined to take on, experimenting, inventing, risking, trying to work out new forms of organization, new modes of struggle, new visions and concepts to guide the undergird and undergird them, starting on their own home ground. For Walter Rodney, the WPA was one element of the job and his research and writing was another. He saw no contradiction between them. All elements of the task were held firmly together by the righteous integrity of his life. The disciplined power of his visions and his undying love for the people and their possibilities. Thus, he went about doing the job that needed to be done. But as it was said of Malcolm X, so it could be said of Walter. He became much more than there was time for him to be. Now we are starkly aware of the fact that the time he no longer has is really ours. That the job he took on is in our hands. To continue to redefine wherever we are, whoever we are. The call that he tried to answer is here for all, for us all. If we want humanity to advance a step further, we must invent and we must make discoveries. We must turn over a new leaf. We must work out new concepts and we must try to set afoot a new humanity. Walter's legacy. It is in our courageous, creative attempts to respond to such a magnificent summons that we begin to break the chains of our underdevelopment and shake the foundations of all human exploitation. And it is not clear by now that the process is of exploitation leads to an underdevelopment, underdeveloped humanity, both at the center and at the periphery. Uh, and is it not clear by now that the process of exploitation leads to an, an underdeveloped humanity, both at the center and at the periphery? Do we not see that the underdevelopment of the center in the homeland of the exploiters is simply covered over with material possessions and deadly weaponry, but the nakedness and human retardation are nevertheless there? So who among us does not need to break the coils of the past to transcend and recreate our history? Perhaps it is only as we take up the challenge of Walter and Fanon that we will be prepared to give up all the deadly games of the last half millennia, seeking out new means of defense, new forms of struggle, new pathways toward revolution, new visions of what truly humane society demands of us. Only us, only as we begin to entertain such thoughts, consider such inventions, we will be prepared, will we be prepared to carefully examine again and then move beyond the marvelous limits of how Europe and the developed Africa, pressing on in the spirit of Rodney and Fanon to answer a new question. How shall we redevelop the world? Beginning with ourselves, beginning where we are, what must we tear down? What must we build up? What foundations must we lay? And I will say this knowing very well what entity I am working against, that one of the things that I did um, this year to start detaching from this system is sell all the investment I had in stocks and not invest anymore in stocks because supporting the stock market is supporting the exploitation of Africans. So that 
that was my choice. You can choose to, you cannot, but that is something I did, something I can do now. The other thing I did recently, a few years ago, was go natural. Um, my hair, I don't wear makeup. I've always not worn makeup, but just being more intentional about it. Um, I also started supporting uh, African uh, um, uh, clothing lines. That's another thing I did. I'm just giving you examples of the things that you can do in your life that are not going to be uh, a drastic change. And I think the transition, the slow transition is important. Um, and I am now, when I'm doing the things I do, I do them collectively. I don't want to, I know I'm here reading as an individual, but I'm reading as a community, whether you see it or not, um, supported by a community. If we can all start doing collective economics and working as a community, uniting to do so, that's something else that we can do right now uh, that will not be a drastic change and a shock to the brain. I continue. Who shall we work with? What visions can we create? What hopes shall possess us? How shall we organize? How shall we be related to those who raise the same questions in South Africa, El Salvador, in Guyana? How shall we communicate with others the urgency of our time? How shall we envision and work for the revolutionary transformation of our own country? What are the interventions, the discoveries, the new concepts that will help us move toward the revolution we need in this land? Neither rhetoric nor coercion will serve us now. We must decide whether we shall remain crippled and underdeveloped or move to participate in our own healing by taking on the challenge to redevelop ourselves, our people, our endang endangered nation and the earth. No one can force us toward this. By conventional measurements, there are no guarantees of success. None. And you all should not expect them. You should hope for them. As the blood of our martyrs and heroes known and less known, like Walter Rodney and Franz Fanon, Ruby Doris and Fanny Lou, Malcolm and Martin fully testify. I'll read that sentence because I did interrupt mid-sentence. By conventional me measurements, there are no guarantees of success. As the blood of our martyrs and heroes, known and less known, like Walter Rodney and Franz Fanon, Ruby Doris and Fanny Lou, Malcolm and Martin fully testify. But there is a world waiting for us, indeed. Many worlds await us. One is the world of our children, not yet born, or just beginning, but wanting to live, to grow, to become their best possible selves. This will not happen unless, as Walter suggests, the center is transformed and fundamentally changed. That will not happen unless we are transformed, redeveloped, and renewed. The future of our children depends upon these rigorous transformations. The Afro-American challenge. We're still in the introduction. Then there is another more difficult world that awaits us. The world of the sons and daughters of Europe, America, who have begun to, to discover their own underdevelopment, who recognize the warping and desensitizing of their spirits. Without rehearsing all the old political arguments about coalitions and alliances, neither forgetting the past nor being bound by it, we must find some way to respond to them and, allow, and to allow them to come in touch with us. There is no passing luxury in the old, nice relations style. Rather, we now realize that the children of the oppressed and the children of the oppressors are involved in a dialectical relationship that is deeper than most of us choose to recognize and that there is no fundamental redevelopment for one without the other. This is a heavy burden, but it represents a great possibility as well. In this country, with our peculiar history, it is also an undeniable reality. So, it is by the way of these difficult issues that we return to Walter and his great work. Now, what seems demanded of us as we revisit how Europe and the developed Africa, is that we read it this time in the light of Walter Rodney's life and death, this time in the consciousness of the dangerous, explosive American center, this time in the company of our children, this time in the presence of Fanon's insistent call 
to us all. I will add, this time in the time of coups in Africa, this time in the time of neo-colonial African leaders who are changing constitutions to keep their interests uh, served, this time when we are blinded by the uh, titles of aid, this time when Nairobi is hosting a supposed African climate summit, but it has nothing to do with the well-being of Africa, we must, must sit with how Europe and a developed Africa and self-reflect and decide what we're going to do, if we're going to remain exploited or if we're going to fight the exploitative systems and come above them uh, for the well-being of African people. Then we shall likely see more clearly than ever before that Europe's and the development of Africa and other worlds required Europe's ravaging of itself and everyone and everything that came under its sway. So the wounded are all around us and within us. That is a deep truth. Now, opening ourselves to all those who recognize the brutal dialectics of underdevelopment, who acknowledge the cohesive powers of our common needs, our common dangers, and our common possibilities, we can begin to stand in a newly grounded solidarity and reach out toward each other. Facing the harsh but beautiful fact that we must either redevelop ourselves and our world or be pushed together into some terrible, explosive closing of the light. I will read that one more time. Now, opening ourselves to all those who recognize the brutal dialectics of underdevelopment, who acknowledge the cohesive powers of our common needs, our common dangers, and our common possibilities. We can begin to stand in a newly grounded solidarity and reach out toward each other, facing the harsh but beautiful fact that we must either redevelop ourselves and our world or be pushed together into some terrible, explosive closing of the light. Of course, if we choose to go the way of our essential community, we cannot go far by responding primarily to the urgency of fear for that would repeat history rather than transform it, and that would be unfaithful to a courageous brother like Walter. Instead, we must be drawn by the fact that there is much to attract us. For instance, one of the hopeful elements on the other side of the patterns of domination, subordination, of the past 500 years has been the drawing of humankind into networks of communication and interrelatedness that hold great possibilities for the establishment of new communities beyond the traditional national barriers. I am here with you all today reading this online, reaching many people because of that fact. Reshaped and redirected, the me mechanisms of exploitation may actually place some vital means of rede redevelopment within our grasp. Now it is in our hands to overcome our history, to break the shackles of the past, to redevelop ourselves, our people, our nation, our world, to find humane, creative, and fearless ways of dealing with those who presently oppose such development. There are audacious visions and truly awesome responsibilities, but we must go forward. Indeed, it seems clear to us that even without any guarantees of success, we must move in the flow of humankind's best most creative imagination in the direction of our most profoundly renewing dreams. Anything less is adequate, is inadequate for the perilous times. Anything less would be unworthy of the memory of our brother, the needs of our children, or the magnificent untapped capacities of our own best selves. That's the introduction written on March 19. 81 by Vincent Harding, Robert Hill, William Strickland. Um, it is 9.21 now. We started at 8 o'clock. Um, I can read the first chapter. Um, I will take a quick break. And please put in the chat um, any observations, any questions you have, 
any suggestions, uh, any improvements uh, you 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 see that we need in the way we are presenting this that will better um, the 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 mission of reaching more people and and sending this message out. Um, and I'm going to say, and it seems like a plug, but is it's the the the, uh, the truth, and it's needed. Subscribe, share with others, ask them to subscribe. Help us get to those numbers that help videos be more distributed by YouTube. Help us um, hit those requirements on YouTube that allow these videos to reach as many people as possible, that allow it that when someone enters YouTube, it is one of the videos at the top so that they can um, uh, get this message, not just this video, but every video that we send out to decolonize minds and i say the same not just for kumbukeni but all those other entities all those other black led uh black owned uh african when i say black african led african old telling the the story of the african from the african perspective without the colonial mindset without the white gaze uh, support all those uh, entities so that they can reach more Africans. We have, um, we charge colonialism is one of them. Uh, we have Tunacheki, who we started with them here. We have Wodemaya, different style of reaching out to you all, but he is still reaching out to you all um, to show Africa's truth. So support all of them and we'll continue to share them every time I get a chance and I see one of them, I will share them um, on my Instagram for those of you who follow me. So a quick break and then we'll come back to start chapter one and we'll end at 10 o'clock. Welcome back. Um, yes, Muata Garai, um, your question, um, would that fund also be used to pay legal fees for our political prisoners and those under attack by the system? Yes, 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 yes. It would be to support everything that, um, all the barriers, that's what that fund would be supporting, right? We look at our situation where we're, we're seeking liberation and there are barriers. So how do we take away those barriers? So us coming together to put together a financial fund, um, to put together um, 
organizations to come together and think and, and put together strategies of moving forward, all that is going to be towards taking away, away um, getting rid of the barriers that are in the way to our liberation, whatever they may be, including um, getting political prisoners out of prisoner, prison. Um, you're right, the larger problem is the fact that we fear freedom, right? We fear what needs to be done to get freedom. That's the, that is the problem, it really is. We fear what must be done to, uh, to get freedom and we are allowing that fear to control our actions. Um, that is, and I'm not blaming anyone because it, it takes a lot to say, I, I acknowledge that I may be thrown in prison, I might not be there for my children, I might be killed. I to always look over your shoulder is not a good way to feel. Um, but unfortunately, um, this is the um, the situation we find ourselves in. I would have liked it to be to not be this. So um, it's nine twenty eight. I will start the first chapter, and we can see. And I'm I'm tempted to go. So we'll see. I'll, I'll stop talking too much and we'll see how well we're doing because I'm tempted to do the whole chapter uh, even beyond two hours. I just might do that. Um, yeah, let's start. Let's see how it goes. Some questions on development, chapter one. In contrast with the surging growth of the countries in the socialist camp and the development taking place, I'll bite much more slowly in the majority of the capitalist countries is the unquestionable fact that a large portion of the so-called underdeveloped countries are in total stagnation, and that in some of them, the rate of economic growth is lower than that of population increase. These characteristics are not fortuitous. They correspond strictly to the nature of the capitalist system in full expansion, which transfers to the dependent countries the most abusive and barefaced forms of exploitation. It must be clearly understood that the only way to solve the questions now besetting mankind is to eliminate completely the exploitation of dependent countries by developed capitalist countries with all the consequences that it that this implies. That's Che Guevara, 1964. That is Che Guevara in 1964. What is development? Development in human society is a many-sided process at the level of the individual, it implies increased skill and capacity, greater freedom, creativity, self-discipline, responsibility, and material well-being. Some of these are virtually moral categories and are difficult to evaluate, depending as they do on the age on which one lives, one's class origins, and one's personal code of what is wrong. However, what is indisputable is that the achievement of any of those aspects of personal development is very much tied in with the state of the society as a whole. From earliest times, man found it convenient and necessary to come together in groups to hunt and for the sake of survival. The relations which develop within, our, within any given social group are crucial to an understanding of the society as a whole. Freedom, responsibility, skill have real meaning only in terms of the relations of men in society. Of course, each social group comes into contact with others. The relations between individuals in any two society are regulated by the form of the two societies. Their respective political structures are important because the ruling elements within each group are the ones that begin to have dialogue, trade, or fights as the case may be. At the level of social groups, therefore, development implies an increasing capacity to regulate both internal and external relationships. Much of human history has been a fight for survival against natural hazards and against the real and imagined human enemies. Development in the past has always meant the increase in the ability to guard the independence of the social group and indeed to infringe upon the freedom of others something that often came into the irrespective of the will of the persons within the societies involved. So all this talk of the imperialists developing Africa, beware. 
Men are not the only beings that operate in groups, but the human species embarked upon a unique line of development because man had the capacity to make and use tools. The very act of making tools was a stimulus to increasing rationality rather than the consequence of a fully matured intellect. In historical terms, man, the worker, was, ve was every bit as important as man, the thinker, because the work with tools liberated men from sheer physical necessity so that he could impose himself upon other more powerful species and upon nature itself. The tools with which men work and the manner in which they organize their labor are both important indices of social development. More often than not, the term development is used in an exclusive economic sense, the justification being that the type of economy is itself an index of other social features. What then is economic development? A society develops economically as its members increase jointly their capacity for dealing with the environment. This capacity for dealing with the environment is dependent on the extent to which they understand the laws of nature, science, on the extent to which they put that understanding into practice by devising tools, technology, and on the manner in which work is organized. Taking a long-term view, it can be said that there has been constant economic development within human society since the origins of man, because man has multiplied enormously his capacity to win a living from nature. The magnitude of man's achievement is best understood by reflecting on the curly history of human society and noting the following. Firstly, the progress from crude stone tools to the use of metals. Secondly, the changeover from hunting and gathering wild fruit to the dom domestication of animals and the growing of food crops. And thirdly, the improvement in organization of work from being an individualistic activity towards being an activity which assumes a social character through the participation of many. Every people have shown a capacity for independently increasing their ability to live a more satisfactory life through exploiting the resources of nature. Every continent independently participated in the early epochs of the extension of man's control over his environment, which means in effect that every continent can point to a period of economic development. Africa, being the only the original home of man was obviously a major participant in the processes in which human groups displayed an ever increasing capacity to extract a living from the natural environment indeed in the early period africa was the focus of the physical development of man as such as distinct from other living beings development was universal because the conditions leading to economic expansion were universal Everywhere, man was faced with the task of survival by meeting fundamental material needs, and better tools were a consequence of the interplay between human beings and nature as part of the struggle for survival. Of course, human history is not a record of advances and nothing else. There were periods in every part of the world when there were temporary setbacks and actual reduction of the capacity to produce basic necessities and other services for the population. But the overall, t overall tendency was towards increased production. And, it, and at given points of time, the increase in the quantity of goods was associated with a change in the quality of character of society. This will be shown later with reference to Africa, but to indicate the universal application of the principle of quantitative or qualitative change, an example will be drawn from China. Early man in China lived at the mercy of nature and slowly discovered such basic things as the fact that fire can be man-made and that seeds of some grasses could be planted in the soil to meet food requirements. Those discoveries helped inhabit inhabitants of China to have simple farming communities using stone tools and producing enough for bare subsistence. That was achieved several thousands years before the birth of Christ or the flight of the prophet Muhammad. The goods produced at that stage were divided more or less equally among the members of society who lived and worked in families. By the time of the Tang Dynasty of the 7th century AD, China had expanded its economic capacity not only to grow more food,
but also to manufacture a wide variety of items such as silks, porcelain, ships, and scientific devices. This, of course, represented a quantitative increase in the goods produced, and it was interrelated with qualitative changes in society, in Chinese society. By the later date, there was a political state where before there were only self-governing units. Instead of every family and every individual performing the tasks of agriculturalists, house builders, tailors, there had arisen specialization of function. Most of the population still tilled the land, but there were skilled artisans who made silk and porcelain, bureaucrats who administered the state, and Buddhist, Buddhist and Confucian religious philosophers who specialized in trying to explain those things that lay outside of immediate understanding. Specialization and division of labor led to more production as well as inequality in distribution. A small section of Chinese society came to take a disproportionate share of the proceeds of human labor. And that was the section which did least to actually generate wealth by working in agriculture or industry. They could afford to do so because grave inequalities had emerged in the ownership of the basic means of production, which was the land. Family land became smaller as far as most peasants were concerned, and a minority took over the greater portion of the land. Those changes in land tenure were part and parcel of development in its broadest sense. That is why development cannot be seen purely as an economic affair, but rather as an overall social process which is dependent upon the outcome of man's efforts to deal with his natural environment. Through careful study, it is possible to comprehend some of the very complicated links between the changes in the economic base and the changes in the rest of the superstructure of the society, including the sphere of ideology and social beliefs. The changeover from communalism in Asia and Europe led, for instance, to codes of behavior peculiar to feudalism. The conduct of the European knights in armor had much in common with that of the Japanese samurai or warriors. They developed notions of so-called chivalry, conduct becoming a gentleman, knight, or horseback, while in contrast, the peasant had to learn extreme humility, deference, and obsequ obsequiousness, symbolized by doffing his cap and standing bareheaded before his superiors. In Africa, too, it was to be found that the rise of the state and superior classes led to the practice whereby common subjects prostrated themselves in the presence of the monarchs and aristocrats. When that point had been reached, it became clear that the rough equality of the family had given way to a new state of society. In the natural sciences, it is well known that in many instances, quantitative change becomes qualitative after a certain period. The common example is the way that water can absorb heat, a quantitative process. Until 100 degrees centigrade, it changes to steam, a qualitative change of form. Similarly, in human society, it has always been the case that the expansion of the economy leads eventually to a change in the form of social relations. Karl Marx, writing in the 19th century, was the first writer to appreciate this and he distinguished within European history several stages of development. The first major stage following after simple bands of hunters was communalism. Communalism, where property was collectively owned, work was done in common, and goods were shared equally. The second was slavery, caused by the extension of domineering elements within the family and by some groups being physically overwhelmed by others. Slaves did a variety of ta tasks, but their main job was to produce food. The next stage was feudalism, where agriculture remained the principal means of making a livelihood. But the land which was necessary for that purpose was in the hands of the few, and they took the lion's share of the wealth. The workers on the land, now called serfs, were no longer the personal property of the masters, but were tied to the land of a particular manor or estate. When the manor changed hands, the serfs had to remain there and provide goods for the landlord, just keeping enough to feed themselves. Ooh, that sounds like the executive branch. 
or the um, civil sector of the US government and many other governments. Just as the child of a slave was a slave, so the children of serfs were also serfs. Then came capitalism under, the, under which the greatest wealth in the society was produced not in agriculture, but by machines, in factories and in mines. Like the preceding phase of feudalism, capitalism was characterized by the concentration in a few hands of ownership and the of ownership of the means of producing wealth and by an equal distribution of the products on, of human labor. And that there is the problem with capitalism, the unequal distribution of the products of human labor, despite the fact that the human labor is what produces the products. The few who dominated were the bourgeoisie who had originated in the merchants and craftsmen of the feudal epoch and who rose to be industrialists, industrialists and financiers. Meanwhile, the serfs were declared legally free to leave the land and go in search of employment in capitalist enterprises. Their labor thereby became a commodity, something to be bought and sold. Slavery, enslavement of Africans. It was predicted that there would be a further stage, that of socialism, in which the principle of economic equality would be restored as in communalism, communalism. In the present century, the phase of socialism has indeed emerged in some countries. Economically, each succeeding stage represented development in the strict sense that there was increased capacity to control the material environment and thereby to create more goods and services for the community. The greater quantity of goods and services were based on greater skills and human inventiveness. Man was liberated in the sense of having more opportunities to display and develop his talents. Whether man uplifted himself in a moral sense is open to dispute. The advance in production increased the range of powers which sections of society had over, had over other sections and it multiplied the violence which was part of the competition for survival and growth among social groups. It is not at all clear that a soldier serving capitalism in the last world war was less primitive in the element sense of the word than a soldier serving in one of Japan's feudal armies in the 16th century, or for that matter, than a hunter living in the first phase of human organization in the forests of Brazil. Nevertheless, we do know that in those three respective epochs, hunting hand, feudalism, capitalism, the quality of life improved. It became less hazardous and less uncertain, and members of society potentially had greater choice over their destinies. All of that is involved when the word development is used. In the history of those societies which have passed through several modes of production, the opportunity is presented of seeing how quantitative changes give rise ultimately to air entirely different society. Um, just give me a quick uh, minute. Hopefully, as I continue to recover, these breaks will be less, but just give me a quick minute. Um, sorry about that. And I added that burner um, so that we can support the Walter Rodney Foundation. Again, we thank Mama Rodney um, for allowing us to um, 
to have these readings, um, she gave us the permissions we need to legally um, do these readings every week on Kumbukeni. And we, we're grateful for that because um, like we mentioned yesterday as we were talking about uh, Mama Winnie, Madikizela, Mandela, um, those women who stand next to those men must be recognized. And she is continuing the work that her husband, Walter Rodney, started, and we're grateful for that. And this is part of that continuation. So for those of us who have the means, financial means, to uh, make up, right, when, when, when they need to sell books, they need to continue the work, they need to, the finances to continue the work that they're doing uh, at the Walter Rodney Foundation, let's uh, send money. You see the, the, the link there where you can take action. There's different options of how you can take action. Just visit the link and support, 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 please. We who have means, and this is the thinking that I hope we all embrace um, because I believe it's, it's going to lead us to our liberation. Those of us who have means must be willing to take care of those of us who don't have means and lift them up so that they too can live comfortable lives and get to a place where they can support themselves. So if you have extra, share it. That's what that is. It's not donations. It's not aid. It's not, uh, what, what do they call it? Um, here, uh, well, what's it called? Welfare. No, it is you sharing your excess with your fellow human beings. Ubuntu. I am because you are. And therefore, I want to maintain your well being so that your well being can maintain my well being. It's a cycle of caring for each other. We continue. The key feature is that. At given junctures, the social relations in the society were no longer effective in promoting advance. Indeed, they began to act as breaks on the productive forces and therefore had to be discarded. Take, for instance, the epoch of slavery in Europe. However morally indefensible slavery may have been, it did serve for a while to open up the mines and agricultural plantations in large parts of Europe and notably within the Roman Empire. But then those peasants who remained free had their labor depressed and underutilized because of the presence of slaves. The slaves were not disposed to work at any tasks requiring skills, so the technological evolution of society threatened to come to a halt. Furthermore, the slaves were restless and slave revolts were expensive to put down. The landowners, seeing their estates going to ruin, decided that it will it would be best to grant the legal freedom for which slaves were clamoring and to keep exploiting the labor of these free serfs by ensuring that they had no lands to plow other than those of the landlord, other than those of the landlords. Thereby a new set of social relations, that of landlord and serf, replaced the old relations of slave master and slave. I want us to sit with that for a minute because those of you who want to say we've been emancipated, those of you who want to say we have independence in Africa, I will read that one more time and you can tell me exactly how we have that. And those of you who think that they did that for our well-being, I will read one more time that sentence. The landowners, seeing their estates going to ruin, decided that it would be best to grant the legal freedom for which slaves were clamoring and to keep exploiting the labor of these free serfs by ensuring that they had no lands to plow other than those of the landlords. Thereby, a new set of social relations, that of landlord and serf, replaced the old relations of slave master and slave. And if you all think we are far removed from sharecropping, we are even in a worse situation, I believe, in terms of us getting uh, the products from our labor because now we don't even own land um yeah so something to sit with in some instances the change over to a new mode was accompanied by violence at a critical point this occurred when the ruling classes involved involved were being threatened with removal by the process of change the feudal landlords remained in power for centuries during which the merchant and manufacturing interests grew wealthy and sought to achieve political power and social preeminence. When classes are so well-defined, their consciousness is at a high level. 
Both the landlord class and the capitalists recognized what was at stake. The former fought to hold on to the social relations which no longer corresponded to the new technology of machine production and the organization of work by means of purchasing labor power. The capitalists flung themselves into revolutions in Europe in the 18th and 19th centuries to break the old relations of production. The notion, so for those of you, um, for those of you who talk about capitalism or want to accommodate them, it is saying here that they, capitalists, fought against the systems that were there in order for them to exist. So for those who empathize or whatever misplaced emotion you have for the capitalist system, um, they too, capitalists, at the beginning of capitalism, rose up against what existed then, crushed it so that they could rise up capitalism. The notions of revolution and class consciousness must be borne in mind when it comes to examining the situation of the modern worker and peasant classes in Africa. However, for the greater part of Africa's history, the existing classes have been incompletely crystallized and the changes have been gradual rather than revolutionary. I'm okay with a gradual change as long as we get started. What is probably, wait, let's go back to that because that I think is a criticism as I say that. However, for the greater part of Africa's history, the existing classes have been incompletely crystallized and the changes have been gradual rather than revolutionary. Yes, it is a criticism. What is probably of more relevance for early African development is the principle that development over the world's ter territories has always been uneven. While all societies have been experienced, have experienced development, it is equally true that the rate of development differed from continent to continent. And within each continent, different parts increased their command over nature at different rates. Inside Africa, Egyptians were capable of producing wealth in abundance 25 centuries ago be because of mastery of many scientific natural laws and their invention or technology to irrigate, grow food, and extract minerals from the subsoil. Africans were able before the inv invaders came into Africa. At that time, hunting with bows and even wooden clubs was what people depended on for survival in most parts of the African continent and in various other parts, such as the British Isles. One of the most difficult questions to answer is exactly why different peoples developed at different rates when left of their own, on their own. Part of the answer lies in the environment in which human groups evolved, and part of it lies in the superstructure of the human society. This is to say, as human beings battled with the material environment, they created forms of social relations forms of government, patterns of behavior, and systems of belief, which together constituted the superstructure, which was never the same in any two societies. Each element in the superstructure interacted with the other elements in the superstructure, as well as with the material base. For instance, the political and religious patterns affected each other and were often intertwined. The religious belief that a certain forest was sacred was the kind of element in the superstructure that affected economic activity, since that forest would not be cleared for cultivation. While in the fin final analysis, the breakthrough to a new stage of human development is dependent upon man's technical capacity to deal with the environment, it is also to be borne in mind that peculiarities in the superstructure of any given society have a marked impact on the rate of development. Many observers have been puzzled by the fact that China never became capitalist. It entered the feudal phase of development virtually 1,000 years before the birth of Christ. It had developed many aspects of technology, and it had many craftsmen and artisans. Yet the mode of production was never transformed to one where machines were the main means of production, producing wealth, and where the owners of capital would be the dominant class. The explanation is very complex, but in general terms, the main differences between feudal Europe and feudal China lay in the superstructure, that is, in the body of beliefs, motivations, and social-political institutions 
which derived from the material base but in turn affected it. In China, religious, educational, and bureaucratic qualifications were of utmost importance and government was in the hands of state officials rather than being run by the landlords on their own feudal estates. Besides, there were greater egalitarian tendencies in Chinese land distribution than in European land distribution, and the Chinese state owned a great deal of land. The consequence was that the landowners had greater powers as bureaucrats than as men of property, and they used that to keep social relations in the same mold. It would have been impossible for them to have done that indefinitely, but they slowed down the movement of history. In Europe, the elements of change were not stifled by the weight of a state bureaucracy. As soon as the first capitalists appeared in Europe, in European society, an incentive was created for further development through the attitude of this class. Never before in any human society had a group of people seen themselves consciously functioning in order to make the maximum profit out of production. To fulfill their objective of acquiring more and more capital, capitalists took a greater interest in the laws of science which could be harnessed in the form of machinery to work and make profit on their behalf. At the political level, capitalism was also responsible for most of the features which today are referred to as Western democracy. So for those of you who don't think private interests is what's causing the problems in the world, that sentence. At the political level, and that everything is political, capitalism was also responsible most of the for most of the features which today are referred to as western western democracy we're talking about the lobbyists here now the lobbyists who i'm trying to explain a practical way for you all to see it the lobbyists who pre represent and and advocate for the interests of private entities um giving the us as a, an example uh, on the white house at the white house right um in the government right in the House, the lobbyists who go and influence how the members of the House vote, the lobbyists who intimidate and whatever other means that they use to influence how law is, is written and, and what laws are kept and which ones are taken away. Those are the people controlling the systems that are currently oppressing us, those private interests. The lobbyists are just their, their lurkies, their employees, their um, pawns on the chessboard. In abolition feudalism, the capitalists insisted on parliaments, constitutions, freedom of the press. Lord have mercy, you all know what that is. These two can be considered as development. However, the peasants and workers of Europe, and eventually the inhabitants of the, wor the whole world, paid a huge price so that the capitalists could make their profits front the human labor that always lies behind the machines. That contradicts other facets of development, especially viewed from a standpoint of those who suffered and still suffer to make capitalist achievements possible. This latter group are the majority of mankind. This latter group is us all who work daily, get up and go and spend hours at an office, in a mine, uh, at a plant, there's a strike now with the auto uh, uh, industry in the US. All those people who wake up every morning who cannot get time off and show up at their desks, at their position, wherever you are standing, um, that is the group, the majority uh, of mankind. To advance, they must overthrow capitalism, that group. And this is why the moment capitalism stands in the path of further, further human social and that is why at the moment capitalism stands in the path of further human social development. To put it another way, the social class relations of capitalism are now outmoded, just as slave and feudal relations became outmoded in their time. There was a period when the capitalist system increased the well-being of significant numbers of people as a byproduct of seeking out profits for a few. But today the quest for profits comes into sharp conflict with people's demands that their material and social needs should be fulfilled. 
The capitalist or bourgeois class is no longer capable of guiding the uninhibited development of science and technology. Again, because these objectives now clash with the profit motive. Capitalism has proved incapable of transcending fundamental weaknesses such as underutilization of productive capacity, the persistent of a permanent sector of unemployed, and periodic economic crisis related to the concept of market, the stock market, as I told you, which is concerned with people's ability to pay rather than their need for commodities. Capitalism has created its own irrationalities such as the vicious white racism, the tremendous waste associated with advertising, and the irrationality of incredible poverty in the midst of wealth and wastage, even inside the biggest capitalist economies, such as that of the United States of America. You all know that there's a lot of wastage um, around us all in the US that supports, or that is a result of capitalism. Um, I don't need to get into the details of that. You're all experiencing it every day. Above all, capitalism has intensified its own political contradictions in trying to subjugate nations and continents outside of Europe so that workers and peasants in every part of the globe have become self-conscious and are determined to take their destiny into their own hands. Such a determination is also an integral part of the process of development. It can be offered as a generalization that all phases of development are temporary or transient and are destined sooner or later to give way to something else. It is particularly important to stress, stress this with reference to capitalism because the capitalist epoch is not quite over and those who live at a particular point in time often fail to see that their way of life is in the process of transforming and elimination. Indeed, it is one of the functions of those bourgeois writers who justify cap capitalism to try and pretend that capitalism is here to stay. I have encountered some people on LinkedIn that represent that sentence, but let me just read that one more time. And I have said this before when we spoke of other books. The second time you read the book, you see new things pop out. As you can see, I've read it before, but now I'm seeing new things that I need to, to highlight. So indeed, it is one of the functions of those bourgeois writers who justify capitalism to try and pretend that capitalism is here to stay. A glance at the remarkable advance of socialism over the last 50 odd years will show that the apologists for capitalism are spokesmen of a social system that is rapidly expiring. The fact that capitalism today is still around alongside socialism should warn us that the modes of production cannot simply be viewed as a question of successive stages. And even development has always ensured that societies have come into contact when they were at different levels. For example, one that was communal and one that was capitalist. When two societies of different sorts come into prolonged and effective contact, the rate and character of change taking place in both seriously affected is both in both is seriously affected to the extent that entirely new patterns are created. Two general rules can be observed to apply in such cases. First, the weaker of the two societies, that is the one with less economic capacity, is bound, bound to be adversely affected. And the bigger the gap between the two societies concerned, the more detrimental are the consequences. For example, when European capitalism came into contact with the indigenous hunting societies of America and the Caribbean, the latter were virtu virtually exterminated. Second, assuming that the weaker society does survive, then ultimately it can resume its own independent development only if it proceeds to a level higher than that of the economy which had previously dominated it. The concrete instances of the operation of this second rule are found in the experience of the Soviet Union, China, and Korea. What Walter is telling us here is we currently have the two economic structures and they're both fighting. And these elements um, of both of them is what's going to determine which one is going to win over the other. But if the weaker one wins, 
it must adjust some of its ways to protect itself from the other, uh, uh, to be able to, to fill the gaps that the other one uh, left in society. We'll see how Walter uh, continues. China and Korea were both at a stage approximating feudalism when they were colonized by the capitalist powers of Europe and Japan. Russia was never legally colonized, but while in the feudal stage and before its own indigenous capitalism could get very far, the Russian economy was subjugated by the more mature capitalism of Western Europe. In all three cases, it took a socialist revolution to break the domination of capitalism and only the rapid tempo of socialist development could make amends for the period of subjugation when growth was misdirected and retarded. Indeed, as far as the two biggest socialist states are concerned, the Soviet Union and China, socialist development has already cat catapulted them beyond states such as Britain and France, which have been following the capitalist path for centuries. Now, this book was written, Walter wrote this, this was published, um, this edition is 2018, but the first, the first time Walter wrote these, um, 1972. It is now 2003, and you can see where China is today. Up to the end of the 1950s, the point at which this study terminates, Russia, China, Korea, and certain nations in Eastern Europe were the only countries which had decisively broken with capitalism and imperialism. Imperialism is itself a phase of capitalist development in which Western European capitalist countries, the USA the Jap and Japan established political, economic, military and cultural hegemony, hegemony over other parts of the world which were initially at a lower level and therefore could not resist domination. So imperialism, so that we can go for the roots of the tree and kill the tree of exploitation is just a symptom of capitalism. It's just an arm of capitalism. Imperialism was in effect the extended capitalist system, which for many years embraced the whole world, one part being the exploiters and the other the exploited one part being dominated and the other acting as overlords, one, pa one part making policy and the other being dependent. Socialism has advanced on imperialism's weakest flanks in the sector that is exploited, oppressed and reduced to dependency. In Asia and Eastern Europe, socialism released the nationalist energies of colonized peoples. It turned the goal the nationalist energies of colonized peoples, it turned the goal of production away from the money market and towards the satisfaction of human needs. So for those of you who criticize social socialism, and like I said before, we can call something whatever it is as long as we can see the actions and they're supportive of human well-being, right? Um, socialism released the nationalist energies of colonized peoples. How did it do that? It turned the goal of production away from the money market and towards the satisfaction of human needs. This is what we're talking about now. This is the shortcomings of capitalism. Capitalism is not addressing and satisfying all human needs. Capitalism is satisfying and serving and addressing only certain people's human needs. Only the white working, the white ruling class, sorry right? And the black people who every now and then are invited because they're holding the gates and keeping them closed to that system. And they, even they don't get full because if they go astray, if they try and, 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 and represent themselves fully as African, they will be reminded that they're only there to hold the gates. But that's essentially what we're talking about as we continue to read the book. What system are we going to take on that will satisfy all all human needs. I'm not talking about all of the needs, will satisfy the needs of all humans, general basic needs. It has eradicated bottlenecks such as permanent unemployment and periodic crisis. And it has realized some of the promise implicit in Western or bourgeois democracy by providing the equality of economic condition, 
which is necessary before one can make use of political equality and equality before the law. Socialism has reinstated the economic equality of communalism, but communalism fell apart because of low economic productivity and scarcity. Socialism aims at and has significantly achieved the creation of plenty so that the principle of egalitarian distribution becomes consistent with the satisfaction of the wants of all members of society. Again, that's what we're going for, the satisfaction of the wants, and we're talking about basic survival wants of all members of society. What am I talking about? Food, shelter, clothing, health, and happiness. Happiness, how? Music, to be able to celebrate your music, to, to be able to celebrate your children, to be able to gather peacefully uh, without interference from, to be able to move from one place to the other, to commune with other human beings without worry of your life being ended because you're seen as being in a certain space that you shouldn't be in. To be able to raise your children without worrying about them ending up being in the, in the uh, evening news, having their life been ended by some police officer who is protecting the capitalist system. So this is what we're talking about. One of the most crucial factors leading to more rapid and consistent expansion of economic capacity and a socialism has been the implementation of planned development. Most of the historic processes so far described relate to the involuntary and unplanned development. No one planned that at a given stage, human beings should cease using stone axes and use iron implements instead. And to come more recent times, while individual capitalist firms plan their own expansion, their system is not geared to overall planning of the economy and the society. The capitalist state intervened only fitfully and partially to supervise capitalist development. The socialist state has its prime function the control of the economy on behalf of the working classes. The latter, that is, workers and peasants, have now become the most dynamic force in world history and human development. And if that doesn't tell you all that the power lies within you all, I don't know what will. To conclude this brief introduction to the extremely complex problem of social development, it is useful to recognize how inadequate are the explanations of that phenomenon which are provided by bourgeois scholars. They very seldom try to grapple with the issue of its totality but rather concentrate an attention narrowly on economic development. As defined by the average bourgeois economist, development becomes simply a matter of the combination of given factors of production, namely land, population, capital, technology, specialization, and large scale production. Those factors are indeed relevant, as is implied in the analysis so far but omissions from the list of what bourgeois scholars think relevant are really overwhelming. No mention is meant, <laughs> let's, let's sit with that sentence. Let's sit with both of them because they, they come together. Just bear with me as I mark them. Do not forget where they are. I'll actually mark them with a pencil and come back later. As defined by the average bourgeois economist, that is the social structure, the oppressors speaking, right? Their definition of things. Development becomes simply a matter of the combination of given factors of production, namely land, population, capital, technology, specialization, and large scale production. So how do capitalists, the white ruling class, the oppressors, view development. What do they consider developed, right? So that they can determine something else to be underdeveloped. What they consider developed must have these factors, land, population, capital, technology, specialization, and large scale production. That's what determines GDPs, determines the, the, the power of currency and all that. This is what we're talking about. And it's determined by them, the white ruling class. The, the capitalists, those who control the capitalist systems. 
Those factors are indeed relevant. They are relevant, as is implied in the analysis so far. But omission from the, re the list of what bourgeois scholars think relevant, but omitting other factors that are just as relevant, that's where the problem lies. And it's very overwhelming how these capitalists and the white ruling class omit those other factors that are relevant. I'll give you one factor, your mental health and well-being your physical health and well-being. When they talk about land, population, capital, technology, specialization, and large-scale production, they're not factoring that. They're not factoring your mental well-being. That to them is not relevant. That's not developed. So for example, if we have a society in Africa that has all those other factors and that enhances the well-being of their people, mental well-being, or maybe doesn't have all of those factors, has land, population, capital doesn't have technology and they specialize in certain things that help move uh, uh, maintain and nurture their community and then they have mental well-being we would call that developed because we want to include the holistic uh, uh, structure that supports the well-being of human beings not just these things that the capitalist system has said we should focus on so that i guess the warning here or the caution here is that we should not go by the definition of development of the capitalists no mention is made of the exploitation of the majority which underlay all development prior to socialism walter rodney is approaching it from the negative consequences right when they talk about you're developed because of land population capital technology specialization and large-scale production they don't mention what harm they're causing to satisfy those factors they don't mention that in west africa they're leaving open sewers of oil from the oil fields they have there they're not mentioning that they're kicking people out of their land in uganda in order to put up that pipe therefore the well-being of the people is affected they have no shelter and they're pushed together in, in, in crowded spaces, which increases uh, 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 conflict, right? Which then increases crime. They're not talking about that. They're just telling you, oh, you're developed, but they're not talking about what it took to be developed. And is it harmful? No mention is made of the social relations of production or of classes. No mention is made of the way that the factors and relations of production combine to form a distinctive system or mode of production varying from one historical epoch to another. No mention is made of imperialism as a logical phase of capitalism. No mention is made that they will be imperialists, which mean they will be controlling your policies in Africa. They will be affecting how you do business. They will be squashing your development. They will destroy your economic development or any chance of that they don't mention that when they come to talk to you in those un meetings in those au meetings they don't mention that when they send the lady who came to the african summit climate summit to tell you how lovely you are and how kenya is the greatest country right now in africa they don't tell you that they're giving you because you will walk away if they tell you that so they're going to give you all the sweet words to keep you there to listen and to pumbaza you that's a word in kiswahili zombify you so that you can just go along without questioning makes me angry excuse me no mention is made of imperialism as a logical phase of capitalism in contrast any approach which tries to base itself on socialist and revolutionary principles must certainly introduce into the discussion at the earliest possible point the concepts of class imperialism and socialism as well as the role of the workers and oppressed peoples each new concept bristles with its own complications and it is not to be imagined that the mere resort to certain terminology is the answer to anything. Ah, just what I was saying. It doesn't matter what you call it. The actions is what matters. However, one has at least to recognize the full human, historical and social dimensions of development before it is feasible to consider underdevelopment or the strategies for escaping from underdevelopment. Just like I explained. Walter wants us to have a holistic approach to this thing. What is underdevelopment? Having discussed development, it is easier to comprehend the concept of underdevelopment. Obviously, underdevelopment is not absence of development. 
because every people have developed in one way or another to a greater or lesser extent. Those of you in Africa, in South America, in the Caribbean, in Cuba, and whatever other place is called underdeveloped, please take pride in this sentence. Obviously, underdevelopment is not absence of development because every people have developed in one way or another and to a greater or le lesser extent. Underdevelopment makes sense only as a means of comparing levels of development. It is very much tied to the fact that human social development has been uneven and from a strictly economic viewpoint, some human groups have advanced further by producing more and becoming more wealthy while exploiting the others. That's my addition. The moment that one group appears to be wealthier than others, some inquiry is bound to take place as to the reason for the difference. After Britain had begun to move ahead, some inquiry, some inquiry should take place because we're not inquiring as much as we should. Why is the U.S. so advanced as opposed to other places? We don't ask ourselves that. We just talk about, oh, U.S. is the greatest nation. Why? When there are other places that are, human beings cannot even have food. I mean, even within the United States. Why are they so advanced? If, if indeed they are a nation, they are a nation, and it's not just the U.S., there's many other nations, but if indeed they are a nation that is democratic, why are they not spreading that advancement so that others can advance as well? The moment that one group appears to be wealthier than others, some inquiry is bound to take place as to the reason for the difference. After Britain had begun to move ahead of the rest of Europe in the 18th, 18th century, the famous British economist Adam Smith felt it necessary to look into the causes behind the wealth of nations. At the same time, many Russians were very concerned about the fact that their country was backward in comparison with England, France, and Germany in the 18th century and subsequently in the 19th century. African leadership, you could take a note from that. Today, our main preoccupation is with the differences in wealth between, on the one hand, Europe and North America, and on the other hand, Africa, Asia, and Latin America. In comparison with the first, the second group can be said to be backward or underdevelopment. At all times, therefore, one of the ideas behind underdevelopment is a comparative one. It is possible to compare the economic conditions at two different periods for the same country, and determine whether or not it had developed. And more importantly, it is possible to compare the economies of any two countries at any given time, any given period in time. A second and even more indispensable component of more modern underdevelopment is that it expresses a particular relationship of exploitation, namely the exploitation of one country by another. All of the countries named as underdeveloped in the world are exploited by others. And that the underdeveloped development with which the world is now preoccupied is a product of capitalist, imperialist, and colonialist exploitation. When the capitalists, the imperialists, and the colonialists get on stages, for example, let me not mean name specific names but when they get on stages and call africa underdeveloped they forget to mention that they're the ones who caused that underdevelopment but walter is reminding us that we should not let them get away with that african and asian societies were developed independently until they were taken over directly or indirectly by the capitalist powers when that happened exploitation increased and the export of surplus ensued depriving the societies of the benefit of their natural resources and labor. It is an integral part of underdevelopment in the contemporary sense. In some quarters, it has often been thought wise to substitute the term developing for underdevelop. One of the reasons for so doing is to avoid an, any unpleasantness with which may be attached to the second term which might be interpreted as meaning underdeveloped mentally, physically, morally, or any other respect. Actually, if underdeveloped were related to anything other than comparing economies, then the most underdeveloped country in the world would be the United States. Have that sink in. Which practices external oppression on a massive scale, 
while internally there is a blend of exploitation, brutality, and psych psychiatric, psychiatric disorder. However, on the economic level, it is best to remain with the word underdeveloped rather than developing, because the latter creates the impression that all the countries of Africa, Asia, and Latin America are escaping from a state of economic backwardness relative to the industrial nations of the world, and that they are emancipating themselves from the relationship of exploitation. For those of you with good intention, who want to be in rooms worrying about what labels we are putting on things that we are doing and are advocating. I may actually have been in those rooms as well, advocating as well. And I'm glad to read this because that will not happen again on my part. And I hope it doesn't happen again on your part. Advocating for us to call whatever it is that is going on in Africa developing instead of underdeveloping. Walter is saying, mm -mm, pause. Because what you calling it developing is implying and might put out there is that those nations that you're calling developing are escaping from a state of economic backwardness relative to the industrial nations of the world. Therefore, they are always chasing that standard of those worlds. So Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda is always trying to be like the US instead of maintaining the wellness of Rwandese people based on Rwandese needs. So we're always trying to keep up with the, is it the Benjamins? Instead of just fixing our home and doing what we need and providing the, the resources that we need, we're chasing the US and, and England. And so that's what developing, calling those nations developing, that's what it means. And that they are emancipating themselves from the relationship of exploitation, which is not true because they are not. That is certainly not true. Well, and many underdeveloped countries in Africa and elsewhere are becoming more underdeveloped in comparison with the world's great powers because their exploitation by the metropoles is being intensified in new ways. Economic comparisons can be made by looking at statistical tables or indices of what goods and services are produced and used in the societies under discussion. Professional economists speak of the national income of countries and the national income per capita. These phrases have already become part of the layman's language by way of the newspapers, and no detailed explanation will be offered here. <laughs> it is enough to note that the national income is a measurement of the total wealth of the country, while the per capita income is a figure obtained by dividing the national income by the number of in inhabitants in order to get an idea of the average wealth of each inhabitant. This average can be misleading, can be misleading where there are great extremes of wealth. A young Ugandan put in a very personal form when he said that the per capita income of his country camouflaged the fantastic difference between what was earned by his poor peasant father and what was earned by the biggest local capitalist, Madvani. Sorry. In considering the question of development away from the state of underdevelopment, it is of supreme importance to realize that such a process demands the removal of the gross inequities of land distribution, property holding, and income, which are camouflaged behind national income figures. At one stage in history, advance was made at the cost of entrenching privileged groups. In our times, development has to mean advance which liquidates present privileged groups with their corresponding unprivileged groups. Nevertheless, the per capita income is a useful statistic for comparing one country with another, and the developed countries all have per capita incomes several times higher than any one of the recently independent African nations. The following table gives a clear picture of the gap between Africa and certain nations measured in per capita incomes. It is the gap that allows one group to be called developed and another underdeveloped. The information was obtained from United States statistical publications and applies to the, the year 1968, unless otherwise stated. So I'm just gonna hold this up and I hope you can all see it. And when you get to watch the video, um, you can 
see the table that he's talking about. I think that's clear enough. I'll bring it a little closer. Just take a minute for those who watch the video to see the table. All right. The gap that can be seen from the evidence is not only great, but it is also increasing. Many people have come to realize that the developed countries are growing richer quite rapidly. While underdeveloped countries for the most part show stagnancy or slow rates of growth. In each country, a figure can be calculated to represent the rate at which the economy grows. The growth rate is highest in socialist countries, followed by the big capitalist countries, and with the colonies and ex-colonies trailing far behind. I'm just going to say, because the thought came to mind, um, just because I'm giving my observations of how I'm interpreting this book does not mean it's the only way to interpret it, right? Um, you all can share if you agree, disagree. Um, for the capitalist defenders, you know I'm going to come at you if you come at me with your nonsense. Uh, but for those who are truly having a, 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 a logical and, and, and grounded in goodness and the well-being of human beings who want to, who see it differently, please share in the chat. Um, even after the live, continue sharing in the chat what you're observing. The pro proportion of international trade, which is in the hands of the underdeveloped countries, in, is declining. That proportion was roughly 30% in 1936 and went down to less than 20% in the 1960s. This is an important indicator because trade is both a reflection of the quantity of goods produced and a way of obtaining goods not locally produced. I guess I should clarify what I meant by, by those who are defending capitalists, you know, I'll come for you. We're not arguing whether capitalism is nice. That's not the argument. At least Nduko is not. I'm saying it isn't. And we need to figure out another way. So you coming here to tell me how it is nice means nothing to me. And I will dismiss that comment. And you'll just, you can entertain yourself and go ahead. And for those of you who want solutions, I urge you and encourage you to dismiss those comments and just stick to the ones that are finding solutions. We are agreeing or those of us who agree are saying capitalism is not nice. What else do we create to help us uh, satisfy the needs of all human beings? Developed economies have certain characteristics which contrast with underdeveloped ones. The developed countries are all industrialized. That is to say, the greater part of their working population is engaged in industry rather than agriculture and most of their wealth comes out of mines, factories, and other industries. They have a high output of labor per man in industry because of their advanced technology and skills. That is well known. But it is also striking that the developed countries have a much more advanced agriculture than the rest of the world. Their agriculture has already become an industry, and the agricultural part of the economy produces more even though it is small more even though it is small. The countries of Africa, Asia, and Latin America are called agricultural countries because they rely on agriculture and have little or no industry. But their agriculture is unscientific and the yields are far less than those of the developed countries. In several of the largest underdeveloped nations, there was stagnation and fall in agricultural outputs in and after 1966. In Africa, the output of food per person has been falling in recent years. Because the developed countries have a stronger industrial and agricultural economy than the rest of the world, they produce far more goods than the poor nations in the category of necessities as well as luxuries. It is possible to draw up st statistical tables showing the production of grain, milk, steel, electric power, paper, and a wide range of other goods and showing at the same time how much each commodity is made available to each citizen, on average. Once again, the figures are highly favorable to a few privileged countries in the world. The amount of steel used in a country is an excellent indicator of the level of industrialization. At one extreme, one finds that the USA consumes six, 685 kilograms of steel per person. Sweden, 623 and East Germany, 437. At the other extreme, one finds that Zambia consumes 10 kilograms, East Africa, 8, and Ethiopia, 2. Y'all. 
Sit with that for a minute. At one extreme, one finds that the USA consumes 685 kilograms of steel per person. Sweden, 623. And East Germany, 437. At the other extreme, one finds that Zambia consumes 10 kilograms. East Africa, East Africa, which is made up of Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, 8 kilograms. And Ethiopia, 2. When the same kind of calculation is made for sugar, a sample of the results shows Australia with 57 kilograms, and this is consumption, and North America and the Soviet Union with 45 to 50 on the average. Africa, however, consumes only 10 kilograms of sugar per person per year. And that is better than Asia with seven. This is Africans who are working, laboring to produce that, that sugar. An even more gloomy set of statistics relates to basic food requirements. Each individual needs a certain quantity of food per day, measured in calories. The desirable amount is 3,000 calories per day. But no African country comes anywhere near that figure. Algerians consume on average only 1,870 calories per day, while Ivory Coast can consider itself very well off within an African context with 2,290 calories as the national average. Ivory Coast, which is, I believe we are talking about the Ivory Coast that is still connected and very much um, a gatekeeper of France and which was part of sabotaging the eco, the currency that the West African nations were going to have that was independent of France. That's the Ivory Coast we're talking about. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Furthermore, one also has to judge the protein content of the food. And many parts of Africa suffer from protein farming, which means that even when calories are available from starchy food, protein is not to be found. Persons in developed capitalist and socialist countries consume twice as much protein as those in undeveloped countries. You all know these steak restaurants in the United States, and you've all seen the amount of the portions of the steak that is put on your plate, or the ribs, or whatever else that you all have on your plate, and beans, and, and lentils, and whatever other sources of protein. And look at the plate in Africa. Yet those Africans is who's laboring to produce that for those other nations. Such differences help to make it clear which countries are developed and which are underdeveloped. The social services provided by a country are of importance equal to that of its material production in bringing about human well-being and happiness. It is universally accepted that the state has the responsibility to establish schools and hospitals, but whether these are provided by the government or by pro private agencies, their numbers can be established in relation to the size of the population. The extent to which basic goods and social services are available in a country can also be measured indirectly by looking at the life expectancy, the frequency of deaths among children, the amount of malnutrition, the occurrence of diseases, which could be prevented by inoculation and public health services, and the proportion of illiterates. In all these respects, the comparison between the developed and underdeveloped countries shows huge and even frightening differences. For every 1,000 children who are born alive in Cameroon, 100 never live to see their first birthday. That is a sad statistic. And out of every 1,000 African children born alive in rural Sierra Leone, 160 die before reaching one year. Yet the comparable figures for the United Kingdom and Holland are only 12 and 18 respectively. Besides, many more African children die before they reach the age of five. Lack of doctors is a major drawback. On this, I will pause there quickly. I have said that the country that we should emulate is Cuba. And just the way they strategize on educating doctors. Cuba always has doctors to serve themselves and always provide support to nations who are in need of doctors in time of emergencies. Cuba has been like that for years. 
we as Africans should take note of that and take some lessons from Cuba and implement, not just take them, implement them in Africa. Health and well-being is a very important part to, to life, good life and existence and staying alive. So if, if we're going to start investing and calling ourselves developed countries, at least let's start with focusing education, medical education, to train people to, to help us maintain that health and well-being. Doctors. And not doctors who are working for pharmaceuticals. We're not, that's not the doctor I'm talking about. And I hope that's not the doctor you all will want to talk about. We're talking about the doctors who help you stay away from being sick. We're talking about the doctors who, after they've been helping you stay away from being sick and there are unavoidable circumstances, they will help you get better, not help you stay on medicine, help you get better. That's the doctor I'm talking about. In Italy, there is one doctor for every 580 Italians. <laughs> These numbers will shock you all. Well, maybe not. There is a doctor, there's one doctor for every 500 and 80 Italians. And in Ch Ch Czechoslovakia, there is one doctor for every 510 citizens. In Niger, Niger, that just had a coup, Niger, where France is not leaving, despite being asked to leave because they're cause causing the disparities and the marginalization there, and these numbers is a result of France being there. That Niger is what we're talking about the Niger that a bunch of people have been getting in clubhouse rooms to talk about without knowing this fact. In Niger, one doctor must do for 56,140 persons. One doctor. In Italy, one doctor does for every 580 Italians. I would love to see what one doctor does for in France because we're talking about Niger. In Niger, one doctor, Moja, for those of you who speak Swahili, Dr. Moja, and our Hudumia, 56,140 persons. In Tunisia, one doctor for every 8,320 Tunisians. In Chad, one doctor for 73,460 persons. And this is the capitalism that you all want to keep going? It takes a large number of skilled people to make an industrial economy function. While the countries of Africa have a woefully insufficient number of highly qualified personnel. Hmm? The figures on doctors just given confirm this. And the same problem exists with engineers, technicians, agriculturalists, and even administrators and lawyers in some places. I'm gonna jump in and say something here. So these numbers are already looking bad. And then you have Germany, you have the US, you have the UK, who are causing the economic uh, 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 destruction in those countries, put, putting out calls for nurses and doctors from Africa to go to those nations. The nations that already have one doctor to 580 people, taking from those that already have less doctors per person, like per, per area, to come and help those nations. So this is something for us Africans to think about. I am one of those Africans who takes our skill from Africa and brings it to these lands, that we should keep our skill in Africa because it's needed. For the doctors who are training right now in Africa, stay in Africa. For my friends and my former schoolmates who stayed, I applaud you and continue the good work because I see you all on LinkedIn every day. Africa is in need of more doctors. We should not be sending our doctors to Europe, no matter what the deal is. And that should not be a good thing. I don't want to see these headlines and videos on YouTube talking about how some African president made a good deal with German to send laborers and how that country is helping us. No, they're not helping. We need doctors in Africa, clearly, as the numbers indicate. It takes a large number of skills. And for those of you in the diaspora who ask how you can help Africa and you're trained as doctors, move there and become doctors. It takes a large number of skilled people to make an industrial economy function. While the countries of Africa have a woefully insufficient number of highly qualified personnel, the figures on doctors just given confirm this. And the same problem exists with engineers, technicians, agriculturalists, and even administrators and lawyers in some places. 
Middle level skills in fields such as welding are also lacking. To make matters worse, there is at present a brain drain from Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Western Europe. We all need to go back home and help. This is to say, professionals, technicians, high level administrators, and skilled workers immigrate from their homes and the small number of skilled people available to the underdeveloped world is further depleted by the lure of better pay and opportunities in the developed world. This lopsided nature of the present international economy is strikingly brought home by the fact that the underdeveloped countries must in turn recruit foreign experts at fantastic cost. So what we have left our, the nations in Africa with is the alternative to recruit. So when you see the Wazungus in Kenya, when you see the Wahindis in Kenya, when you see the Mchina in Kenya or whatever other person in Kenya, Kenya is paying a high cost or Rwanda or Tanzania or South Africa for those services when we Africans can go back and serve. That's on us, that's an indictment on us. Most of the data presented so far can be described as quantitative. It gives us measurements of the quantity of goods and services produced in various economies. In addition, certain qualitative assessments have to be made concerning the way that a given economy is put together. For economic development, it is not enough to produce more goods or services. The country has to, I'm just checking to see how many pages are left. Lord have mercy on us all. All right, we can do it. The country has to produce more of those goods and services, which in turn will give rise spontaneously to future growth in the economy. For example, the food producing sector must be flourishing so that workers would be healthy and agriculture on the whole must be efficient so that profits or savings from agriculture would stimulate industry. Heavy industry, such as the steel industry and the production of electric power, must be present so that one is capable of making machinery for other types of industry and for agriculture. Lack of heavy industry, inadequate production of food, and scientific agriculture, those are all characteristics of the underdeveloped economies. It is typical of underdeveloped economies that they do not or are not allowed to, and I'm glad Walter, and of course Walter will do that, are not allowed to concentrate on those sectors of the economy, which in turn will generate growth and raise production to a new level altogether. And there are very few ties between one sector and another so that say agriculture and industry could react beneficially on each other. Furthermore, whatever savings are made within the economy are mainly sent abroad or are frittered away in consumption rather than being redirected to productive purposes. Much of the national income which remains within the country goes to pay individuals who are not directly involved in producing wealth, but only in rendering auxiliary services, civil servants, merchants, soldiers, entertainers. What aggravates the situation is that more people are employed in those jobs than are really necessary to give efficient service. And to crown it all, these people do not reinvest in agriculture or industry. They squander the wealth created by the peasants and workers by purchasing cars, whiskey, and perfume. I'm looking at you, Diamond. All those Tanzanian and wherever you are in Africa, artists. Because he, he says entertainers. I'm looking at you all. All of you, oh, what's in Puff Daddy, I'm looking at you. All of you uh, uh, sports people who are earning millions for one game, millions. And you think that is something to be proud of. Well, you're not giving back to the laborers who are providing the food that you enjoy in those fancy restaurants or making the clothes that you wear. I'm looking at myself too while I look at you. It has been noted with irony that the principal industry of many underdeveloped countries is administration. Not long ago, 60% of the internal revenue of Dahomey went into paying salaries of civil servants and government leaders. 
The salaries given to the elected politicians are higher than those given to a British member of parliament. <laughs> in the Dahomey. And the number of parliamentarians in the underdeveloped African countries is also relatively high. In Gabon, there is, there is one parliamentary representative for every 6,000 inhabitants, compared to one French parliamentary representative for every 100,000 Frenchmen. So apparently Africa has an upside down world. When it comes to doctors, there's one doctor for tens of thousands of Africans. But it, when it comes to representation, representation in, in the civil service, in parliament, your ministers, who are not even doing anything to support you, that number is smaller. It is one minister for hundreds of Africans. And then in Europe, that number also flips there. It is one minister for tens of thousands. We all have to look at our priorities. Members, many more figures at that sort indicate, of that sort indicate that in describing a typical underdeveloped economy, it is essential to point out the high disproportion of the locally distributed wealth that goes into the pockets of a privileged few, politicians. Members of the privileged, that's my addition, Members of the privileged groups inside Attica always defend themselves by saying that they pay the taxes which keep the government going. <laughs> You've all heard this here with Republicans and all those politicians. At face value, this statement sounds reasonable. But on close examination, it is really the most absurd argument and shows total ignorance of how the economy functions. Walter is about to school you all. Taxes do not produce national wealth and development. Wealth has to be produced out of nature, from tilling the land or mining metals or felling trees or turning raw materials into finished products for human consumption. These things are done by the vast majority of the population who are peasants and workers. So Kenya, that is taxing Kenyans highly right now because the IMF has told you that is the way to change and improve your <laughs> your nation and your economy it's a lie taxes do not help what helps is tilling the land or mining metals or felling trees or turning raw materials into finished products for human consumption that is the thing that I, they have said as a requirement for you to get that money that they give you that they are not going to allow you to sanction to 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 um, uh, subsidize. That's the word. That they are not going to allow you to support financially, so that they are able to thrive. Those industries are able to thrive. So they have lied to you that what will develop you is your taxes, taxing, taxing, taxing your people, and you clearly it is exposed here. These things are done by the vast majority of the population who are peasants and workers. There would be no incomes to tax if the laboring population did not work. The incomes given to civil servants, professionals, and merchants come from the store of wealth produced by the community. Quite apart from the injustices in the distribution of wealth, one has to dismiss the argument that the taxpayers' money is what develops a country. In pursuing the goal of development, one must start with the producers and move on from there to see whether the products of their labor are being rationally utilized to bring greater independence and well-being to the nation. To see whether, this is my addition, the products of their labor are being rationally util utilized to bring greater independence and well-being to them. By paying attention to the wealth created by human labor out of nature, one can immediately appreciate that very few underdeveloped countries are lacking in the natural resources which could go into making a better life. And in those cases, it is usually possible for two or three territories to combine together for their mutual benefit. In fact, it can be shown that the underdeveloped countries are the ones with the greatest wealth of natural resources and yet the poorest in terms of goods and services presently provided by and for their citizens. The United Nations, and I'm loving that the United Nations is coming up because Kumkeni will cover them this weekend. We just had anger in the, um, at the United Nations headquarters in, the, in New York. 
The United Nations Survey of Economic Conditions in Africa up to 1964 has this to say about the continent's natural resources, like we asked them. Africa is well endowed with minerals and primary energy resources. With an estimated 9% of the world's population, the region accounts for approximately 28% of the total value of world min mineral production and 6% of its crude petroleum output. In recent years, its share of the latter is increasing. Of 16 important metallic and non-metallic minerals, the share of Africa is in 10 var share of Africa in 10 varies from 22 to 95% of the world's production. Actually, Africa potential is shown to be greater every day with new discoveries of mineral wealth. On the agricultural side, Africa's African soil is not as rich as the picture of tropical forests might lead one to believe. But there are other clima climatic advantages so that with proper irrigation, crops can be grown all the year round in most parts of the continent. The situation is that Africa has not yet come anywhere close to making the most of its natural wealth. And most of the wealth now being produced is not being retained within Africa for the benefit of Africans. Zambia and Congo produce vast quantities of copper, but that is for the benefit of Europe, North America, and Japan. Even the goods and services which are produced inside of Africa and which remain in Africa nevertheless fall into the hands of non-Africans. Thus, South Africa boasts of having the highest per capita income in Africa. But as indication of how this is shared out, one should note that while the apartheid regime assures that only 24 white babies die out of every 1,000 live births, they are quite happy to allow 128 African babies to die out of every 1,000 live births. In, other, in order to understand present economic conditions in Africa, one needs to know why it is that Africa has realized so little of its natural potential, and one also needs to know why so much of its present wealth goes to non-Africans who reside for most part outside of the continent. In a way, underdevelopment is a paradox. Many parts of the world that are naturally rich are actually poor, and parts that are not so well off in wealth of soil and subsoil are enjoying the highest standards of living. When the capitalists from the developed parts of the world try to explain this paradox, they often make it sound as though there is something God-given about the situation. You all know that is true. Going to church and telling you they've been blessed by God. One bourgeois economist in a book on development accepted that the comparative statistics of the world today show a gap that is much larger, larger than it was before. Give me a second. By his own admission, the gap between the developed and the underdeveloped countries has increased by at least 15 to 20 times over the last 150 years. So you can imagine, this book was written in 1972, what the gap is today. However, I urge you Africans, before we get to however, to please decolonize your minds so that we can get to work. And please put fear aside and let's get to work. Because the more of us get to work, the less that fear becomes something because then they cannot arrest all of us and imprison all of us. Literally. Like the more of us who decide we're done and we're doing something, they cannot put all of us in jail. However, the bourgeois economist in question does not give a historical explanation, nor does he consider that there is a relationship of exploitation which allowed capitalist parasites to grow fat and impoverished and impoverished the dependencies. Instead, he puts forward a biblical explanation. He says, it is all told in the Bible. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. Saint Matthew. I'm just going to pause there. And call out the ish. The story of the hath nots is the story of the modern underdeveloped countries. Presumably, the only comment which one can make on that is amen. Yeah. The interpretation that underdevelopment is somehow, and for those Africans who are saying amen, you're literally saying yes to the continuation of your exploitation. 
That is literally what you're saying when you think about it. The interpretation that underdevelopment is somehow ordained by God is emphasized because of the racist trend on in European scholarship. It is in line with racist prejudice to say openly or to imply that their countries are more developed because their people are innately superior and that the responsible responsibility for the economic backwardness of Africa lies in the generic backwardness of the race of black Africans. So those of you who wanna worry and wonder whether you're racist, it is in line with racist prejudice to say openly or to imply that their countries are more developed because their people are innately superior and that the responsibility for the economic backwardness of Africa lies in the generic backwardness of the race of black Africans. An even bigger problem is that the people of Africa and other parts of the colonized world have gone through a cultural and psychological crisis and have accepted, at least partially, the European version of things. So Walter just described the racists and what they say and that it's racist. And then he just told us that we Africans actually believe it. And we now are actually using the same argument. That means that the African himself has doubts about his capacity to transform and develop his natural environment. And as long as we have that doubt, we will never be liberated. I am not an expert. I am not a genius. I am not the, uh, the one who has all the answers. I am just Nduko who is deciding to look at things deeper, uh, lift every rock, look under, and see why on earth my people who are brilliant because I know my mind and I know what I think of and I know what I'm capable of and what I've done so far in my life and I know I'm not dumb. And I've worked with white people who are dumber than me, if that's what we're going to talk about, like let's be real. I've worked with white people who are not capable mentally to come up with the ideas that I do. And I'm saying this whole false notion that they are superior because they're white, I'm calling it out. Because I've been in their spaces and I've seen that I can do things better than them. So we Africans need to stop believing that lie. And we need to start believing that we're capable so that we can be liberated. For as long as, because for as long as we do not believe that we're capable, we will never be liberated. With such doubts, he even challenges those of his brothers who say that Africa can and will develop through the efforts of its own people. If we can determine... Whew, we... I'll go back from the start and read this part. That means that the African himself has doubts about his capacity to transform and develop his natural environment. With such doubts... He even challenges those of his brothers who say that Africa can develop with and will develop through the efforts of its own people. If we can determine when underdevelopment came about, it would dismiss the lingering suspicion that it is racially or otherwise predetermined and that we can do little about it. I am on LinkedIn every now and then arguing with these people, asking me how I think Africa is going to do it. There's that one for you. When the experts from capitalist countries do not give a racist explanation, they nevertheless confuse the issue by giving a causes of underdevelopment, as causes of underdevelopment, the things which really are consequences. For example, they would argue that Africa is in a state of backwardness as a result of lacking skilled personnel to develop. It is true that because of lack of engineers, Africa cannot on its own build more roads, bridges, and hydroelectric stations. But that is not a cause of underdevelopment, except in the rinse that causes and effects come together and reinforce each other. The fact of the matter is that the most profound reasons for the economic backwardness of a given African nation are not to be found inside that nation. All that we can find inside are the symptoms of underdevelopment and the secondary factors that make for poverty. Mistaken interpretations, interpretations of the causes of underdevelopment usually stem either from prejudiced thinking 
or from the era of believing that one can learn the answers by looking inside the underdevelopment, underdeveloped economy. The true explanation lies in seeking out the relationship between Africa and certain developed countries and in recognizing that it is a relationship of exploitation. So if you are coming to the table for a solution, this is a must if you're working with Nduko. If you're coming to the table asking me questions of what we can do, I've had an argument with a capitalist on, on LinkedIn telling me what do, I, what do I think we can do if I refuse capitalism. The true explanation lies in seeking out the relationship between Africa and certain developed countries and in recognizing that it is a relationship of exploitation. So just let's, let's just agree when you come to the table that you'll have that understanding. As, otherwise, don't even come to the room. So you will come with that understanding. And as long as your brain has not understood that, don't come to the room. Man has always exploited his natural environment in order to make a living. At a certain point in time, there also arose the exploitation of man by man, in that a few people grew rich, grew rich and lived well through the labor of others. Then a stage was reached by which people in one community called a nation exploited the natural resources and the labor of another nation and its people. Since underdevelopment deals with the comparative economics of nations, it is the last kind of exploitation that is of greatest interest here. That is the exploitation of nation by nation, imperialism. One of the common means by which one, that was my addition, imperialism. One of the common means by which one nation exploits another and one that is, that is relevant to Africa's external relations is exploitation through trade. Those of you who wanna get on these spaces and talk about free trade and how nice it is that now Africa has this, this entity that is gonna promote free trade. Who is it free for? When the terms of trade are set by one country in a manner entirely advantageous to itself, then the trade is usually detrimental to the trading partner. Bing! To be specific, one can take the export of agricultural produce from Africa and the import of manufactured goods into Africa from Europe, North America, and Japan. The big nations establish the price of the agricultural products and subject these prices to frequent reductions. At the same time, the price of manufactured goods is also set by them, along with the freight rates necessary for trade in the ships of those nations. The minerals of Africa also fall into the same category as agricultural produce as far as pricing is concerned. The whole import-export relationship between Africa and its trading partners is one of an equal exchange and of exploitation. So here go you. You have resources. Businessman. Let's say you're a businessman. You produce certain things. And your customer is the one who's going to come and tell you what the price should be. That is what's going on in Africa. Africa has the resources, but the imperialist nations are the ones saying, this is the price we buy. And you think that's going to be for the well-being of Africans? So we flip that. That is what we should do, solution. And Africa is the one who's going to set the prices and Europe will take it or leaving. And we will do business with those who take it as it is. More far reaching than just trade is the actual ownership of the means of production in one country by the citizens of another. When citizens of Europe own the land and the mines of Africa, this is the most direct way of sucking the African continent. When citizens of Europe own the land and the mines of Africa, this is the most direct way of sucking African, the African continent. Under colonialism, the ownership was complete and backed by military domination. Today, in many African countries, the foreign ownership is still present. Although the armies and flags of foreign powers have been removed, and now even that has changed since 1972 when Walter wrote, wrote this, they're back, the flags are back. The US bases, the China, one China base, maybe two now. The, 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 uh, Arab, the Middle East bases, whatever nations are represented there, the German, the, the, the French, the English bases. 
apparently recently there was a ship, a warship that docked on, on Nigerian shores, an English warship, a British warship. And you ask yourself, what are you, they're, they're talking about they're coming there to help out of something secure. So bring an, a, a first aid war, a ship, not a warship. Huh? Bring a food ship, bring a resources ship, bring a doctor's ship, bring a laborer's ship to help Africa. Keep your warship on your shores to protect yourself, which is what China does. To defend yourself, we'll take that. But don't bring it to our shores and tell us that you're helping us. Today, in many African countries, the foreign ownership is still present. Although the armies and flags of foreign powers have been removed, so long as foreigners own land, mines, factories, banks, insurance companies, means of transportation, newspapers, power stations, then for so long will the wealth of Africa flow outwards into the hands of those elements. Sit with that, my dear Africans, wherever you may be. I will read it again for you, don't worry. Because I have been in spaces being called radical for suggesting that we send away the um, imperialist, uh, the private entities out of Africa so that we can figure out a strategy before moving forward. So long, <laughs> so long as foreigners own land, mines, factories, banks, insurance companies, means of transportation, newspapers, power stations, then for so long will the wealth of Africa flow outwards into the hands of those elements. So just bear with me, let me turn on my lights. And it's gonna have a glare um, that you see that. Just bear with that, uh, please, oh Lord. Um, this reminds me of KLM, right? And the Kenya Airways. Because of free trade, the Kenyans were, 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 were duped into believing that selling shares of Kenya Airways was going to help Kenya Airways. They live, they, this happened, it's happening. Currently, Kenya Airways are very nice. That's, the, I, that's my preferred mode of transportation um, to Kenya. I don't know if I should say that with enemies looking out to take me out if there are some. But that's, I prefer it because you get in, they speak Kiswahili, uh, I can talk to the flight attendants in Kiswahili. I love it. I feel like I'm already at home before I even get at home, get home. But it saddens me that the airline of my childhood that was such a pride, it used to be called the pride of Kenya, the pride of Africa, actually, it was called Kenya Airways, is now largely owned by KLM because the West duped Kenya into believing that through free trade, they should sell portions of those shares to the KLM. And now I am sure some person is sitting, I hope they're sitting regretting, majority of Kenya Airways profits are probably going to, who owns KLM, Amsterdam? They're going to that nation. They're going to KLM and not to Kenya. They're not building the Kenyan economy. This is the ridiculousness of this stuff and that we fall for it. That's where the ridiculousness is. In other words, in the absence of direct political control, Foreign investment ensures that the natural resources and the labor of Africa produce economic value, which is lost to the continent. Those of you who are supporting Bill Gates being in Africa, take note of this. Foreign investment often takes the form of loans to African governments. Naturally, these loans have to be repaid. And then in the 1960s, the rate of repayment, amortization, on official loans in underdeveloped countries rose from $400 million per year. That is the money that is leaving Africa to pay debt, to pay loans, the, the interest. To about $700 million per year in 1972. He's writing in 1972, so you can imagine what it is today. And it is constantly on the increase. He just said it. It's constantly on the increase. So... We're talking about an underdeveloped Africa. Yet, these countries that claim to be helping us develop are taking in the form of interest paid to the loans that they're supposedly giving us millions of dollars out of Africa. And we're supposed to owe debt? Besides, there is interest to be paid. Wait, 
That was just a loan. We didn't even cover the interest. There is interest to be paid on these loans as well as profits which come from the direct investment in the economy. These two sources accounted for the fact that over 500 million flowed outwards from the underdeveloped countries in 1965. The information on these matters of, is seldom complete for the obvious reason that those making the profit are trying to keep things quiet. So the figures given above are likely to be underestimates. You all, African and African leaders, before you celebrate these Africans on LinkedIn, and I'm sorry, I am not one to worry about shame and what you think of me. I will put you in line because now I know the truth. You all who invite these white people, these Wazungus, to come and tell you about how wonderful Kenya is and how you're the, pro the developing country, you need to start asking them, why are we paying this? Why are we paying this if you support our development? That could be used in our economy to develop our economy. Can we keep that money instead of paying you so that we see that you support our development? They are meant to give some idea of the extent to which the wealth of Africa is being drained off by those who invest in and thereby own a large part of the means of production of wealth in Africa. Again, Bill Gates is not there to help Africa. Furthermore, he's not the only one. He's just one who currently is really irritating me. Furthermore, in more recent times, the forms of investment have become more subtle and more dangerous. They include so-called aid and the management of local African companies by international capitalist experts, Bill Gates. While Africa trades mainly with the countries of Western Europe, North America, and Japan, Africa is also diversifying its trade by dealing with socialist countries. And if that trade proves disadvantageous to the African economy, then the developed socialist countries will, so will also have joined the ranks of the exploiters of Africa. Y'all sit with that. You who all want to defend China and Russia and think that BRICS is the rescue of Africa. Hold up, I have an answer for you. When you ask me the questions, or why do you think BRICS is not good for Africa? Let me tell you why I think that. Because Baba Rodney is going to speak for me right now. Why do you think, Nduko, why do you think BRICS is not the answer for Africa? I'm about to give you the answer to that question. While Africa trades mainly with the countries of Western Europe, North America, and Japan, Africa is also diversifying its trade by dealing with socialist countries. And if that trade proves disadvantageous to the African economy, then the developed socialist countries will also have joined the ranks of the exploiters of Africa. And I believe they have, because it is proving to be disadvantageous to African economy. However, it is very essential at this stage to draw a clear distinction between the capitalist countries and the socialist ones. Because socialist countries have never at any time owned any part of the African cont continent, except now they do. It would be sad for me to tell Baba Rodney that, but now they do. Nor do they invest in African economies in such a way as to expatriate profits from Africa. Therefore, Socialist countries are not involved in the robbery of Africa. I'll tell you an example why Nduko says now they do. Um, China, Russia, and them own mines now in Africa. That's one example. Um, on my recent visit to Kenya, um, the Kenyan government is selling a portion of Kenyan land. It's, those of you who think that land belongs to the government, think again. It belongs to Kenya, Kenyans not the government. The government is just there to manage our, our affairs. They should be there serving us. They don't own it. That's a technicality. But the government has made it its business to sell land where the animals, the wild animals, which has been protected for years, reside to the Chinese. So now when you go to the outskirts of Nairobi, you will see apartments owned by Chinese and they're making money out of them. So now they are owning in Africa, which means they're exploiting in Africa because they're taking resources from Africa. They're taking money from Africa. Africans could have built those apartments. Those are, the money from those apartments could have stayed in Africa, generating the economy and building the economy of Africa. But no, that's not happening because it, they are owned by the Chinese. 
However, it is very essential at this stage to draw a clear distinction, I'm repeating that, between the capitalist countries and the socialist ones, because socialist countries have never at any time owned any part of the African continent, nor do they invest in African economies in such a way as to expatriate prof profits from Africa. Therefore, socialist countries are not involved in the robbery of Africa, and we, Babaroni is long gone from us, so that has changed now. Socialist countries are robbing Africa currently. Most of the people who write about underdevelopment, and actually I think China is moving towards capitalism, but that's just me. Most of the people who write about underdevelopment and who are read in the continents of, of Africa, Asia, and Latin America are spokesmen for the capitalist or bourgeois world. They seek to justify capitalist exploitation both inside and outside their own countries. My friend who is arguing with me on LinkedIn, that's a line for you. I would like to be kind, but you're costing my people's well-being, so I can't afford to be kind. One of the things which they do to confuse the issue is to place all underdeveloped countries in one camp and all developed countries in another camp, irrespective of different social systems. So that the terms capitalist and socialist never enter the discussion. Instead, one is faced with a simple division between the individualized nations and those that are not individualized. It is true that both the United States and the Soviet Union are industrialized, and it, it is true that when one looks at the statistics, countries such as France, Norway, Czechoslovakia, and Romania are much closer together than any one of them is to an African country. But it is absolutely necessary to determine whether the standard of living in a given industrialized country is a product of its own internal resources or whether it stems from exploiting other countries. The United States has a small proportion of the world's population and exploitable natural wealth and exploitable natural wealth, but it enjoys a huge percentage of the wealth which comes from exploiting the labor, the natural resources of the whole world. The erroneous, erroneous views about underdevelopment and the oversimplified distinction between rich and poor nations are opposed by socialist scholars both inside and outside the socialist countries. Those erroneous views are also being exposed by economists in underdeveloped countries who are discovering that the explanations offered by bourgeois scholars are explanations which suit the interests of those countries which exploit the rest of the world through trade and investment. One French socialist writer, Pierre Jolie, Jolie, proposes that to obtain a proper perspective of relations between developed countries and underdeveloped ones, two countries should be set up, namely imperialist and socialist. The socialist camp includes all countries big and small which have decided to break away from international capitalism. The imperialist camp contains not only the capitalist giants like the United States, France, West Germany, and Japan, but also the weak nations in which those industrial nations have investments. Therefore, the imperialist camp can be subdivided into exploiting and exploited countries. For the most part, the nations of Africa fall into the group of exploited countries inside the capitalist imperialist system. Roughly one third of the world's peoples are already living under some form of socialism. The other two thirds constitute the capital capitalist imperialist camp with the majority being in the exploited section. It is interesting, I, I wanna take note there, the current countries that we consider socialist, um, Russia and China are currently imperialist. Uh, that's my take. The interest, the, it is interesting to notice that in spite of their efforts to confuse the situation, the bourgeois writers often touch on the truth. For example, the United Nations, which is dominated by Western capitalist powers, would never stress the exploitation by capitalist nations, but their economic reviews refer on the one hand to the centrally planned economies, which means the socialist countries, and on the other hand, they speak of the market economies, which means in effect the imperialist sector of the world. The, late, the latter is subdivided into the developed market of economists or economics and the developing market economies. 
there's a speech that uh, Macron put out recently, and I think he's using that a lot in that uh, speech. Just listen out to it and you will you will see the, the language that they use to cover their evil. Disguising the fact that the market means capitalist market. This study is concerned with analyzing the relations between those countries which are together within the capitalist market system. The things which bring Africa into the capitalist market system are trade, colonial domination, and capitalist investment. Trade has existed for several centuries. Colonial rule began in the late 19th century and has almost disappeared. Again, Baba Rodney, I would be sad to tell you no. And the investment in the African economy has been increased, increasing steadily in the present century. Throughout the period that Africa has participated in the capitalist economy, two factors have brought about underdevelopment. In the first place, the wealth created by African labor and from African resources was grabbed by the capitalist countries of Europe. And in the second place, restrictions were placed upon African capacity to make the maximum use of its economic potential, which is what development is all about. The IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, which must go if we're going to be liberated. I mean, thing of the past in history books never to exist again. They can find other jobs. The IMF, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization must go. For those of you who are serious about liberation, they must be a thing of the past because they restrict, they place restrictions upon African capacity to make the maximum use of its economic potential which is what development is all about. They take away the thing that would help Africa develop. That's what the IMF, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization, among many other entities, but I'm looking at those right now, do. So they must go if we're going to build African economy. They must, they literally must go. Um, and it's also saying that the wealth, wealth created by African labor and for African resources was grabbed by the capitalist countries of Europe. That reminded me of English tea. For those of us who drink English tea, uh, when we, we want to re be revolutionary in our own simple ways, we must. Um, that's not English tea. And I will, I will take any correction from someone who will show me a picture of a tea plantation in England. Show me tea growing in England and I'll call it English street tea. And show me English people growing tea in England, and I will call it English tea. But for as long as I know where that tea is growing and who's laboring for it, I will call it Kenyan tea, Ugandan tea, Ethiopian tea, Rwandese tea, African tea. Those two processes represent the answer to the two questions raised above as to why Africa has realized so little of its potential and why so much of its present wealth goes outside of the continent. African economies are integrated into the very structure of the developed capitalist economics, economics and they are integrated in, the manner, in a manner that is unfavorable to Africa and ensures that Africa is dependent on the big capitalist countries. Indeed, Structural dependence is one of the characteristics of underdevelopment. Structural dependence is one of the characteristics of underdevelopment. I'm thinking of this, we're talking about Africa, but even to my brothers and sisters who are descendants of Africans who are forcefully taken, kidnapped from Africa, I will say this to you. Your dependence on the system that you live within is why you're underdeveloped. And I recently attended a conference where the gentleman speaking, I'm going to say his name, Chairman Omali Yeshetelli of uh, the African uh, People's Socialist and Uhuru Movement said that instead of complaining about the things that are happening in our communities, we should take it upon ourselves to fix them. And that speaks to this dependence. Instead of depending on congressmen, senators, representatives to do for us, to put in laws that will support us. We should start fixing that. That's what the Black Panthers did. They took, they, they stopped depending on the system that was not serving them. And they took solutions, the matters into their own hands to build solutions. 
if you have children who are not being fed before they go to school, we should start prod programs that feed them. If the education is miseducating, miseducate, we should start programs that educate our, our children accordingly. So it is upon us to stop being dependent and start developing ourselves. Because as long as we are dependent, we will be underdeveloped. Most progressives, writers divide the capitalist imperialist system into two parts. The first is the dominant or metropolitan section, and the countries in the second group are often called satellites because they are in the orbit of the metropolitan economies. The same idea is conveyed by simply saying that the underdeveloped countries are dependencies of the metropolitan capitalist economies. economics. When a child or the young of an, any animal species ceases to be dependent upon its mother for food or protection, it can, food and protection, it can be said to have developed in the direction of maturity. You know, sometimes these things are so simple, it's so annoying. The answers are so simple, it's so annoying that we don't get it. That we Africans are busy de de defending when it's like in our face. The writing is on the wall, but we're not getting it. A simple explanation, and I thank Baba Ronnie for using it. When a child or the young of any animal species ceases to be dependent upon its mother for food and protection, it can be said to have developed in the direction of maturity. Dependent nations can never be considered developed. It is true that modern conditions force all countries to be maturely, mutually interdependent in order to satisfy the needs of their citizens. But that is not incompatible with economic independence because economic independence does not mean isolation. Those of you who argue that when Africa decides to kick these people out of Africa so that they can have economic independence, oh, are they going to isolate themselves? Oh, how can they exist without? No, we haven't even talked about that. That's not an issue. We're not talking about that right now. Stop distracting us from the conversation. We want economic independence, and then we'll figure out whether we're going to involve you. But it's going to be at, on our terms. It does, however, require a capacity to exercise choice in external relations in our own terms. It does, however, require a capacity to exercise choice in external relations. And above all, it requires that a nation's growth at some point must become self-reliant and self-sustaining. Such things are obviously, obviously, in direct contradiction to the economic dependence of numerous countries on the metropoles of Western Europe, North America, and Japan. It is also true that metropoles are dependent on the wealth of the exploited portions of the world. Now, here you go with the power of us Africans. So that you want to say, oh, the US can survive without Africa. Oh, France can do without Africa. Yeah, right. Let's try that. Let's try that for a month. Let's see how it works. It is also true that metropoles, US, France, England, name them, are dependent on the wealth of the exploited portions of the world. They cannot exist the way they do without the resources of Africa. This is a source of their strength and a potential weakness within the capitalist imperialist system. He's giving you the answer, the hint. Duh. This is a source of their strength and a potential weakness within the capitalist imperialist system. Since the peasants and the workers of the dependencies are awakening to a realization that it is possible to cut the tentacles which imperialism has extended into their countries. However, there is a substantial difference between the dependence of the metropoles on the colonies of the subjugation and the subjugation of the colonies under a foreign capitalist yoke. The capitalist countries are technological, and here comes the argument that we must understand. The capitalist countries are technologically more advanced and are therefore the sector of the imperialist system which determined the direction of change. A striking example of this effect is the fact that synthetic fabrics manufactured in the capitalist metropoles have begun to replace fabrics made from raw material grown in the colonies. That mud cloth is being replaced. In other words, within certain limits, it is the technologically advanced metropoles who can decide when to end their dependence on the colonies in a particular sphere. 
In other words, with certain limits, and I hope to God we can hold on to those limits because they are for us, it is the technologically advanced metropoles who can decide when to end their dependence on the colonies in a particular sphere. When that happens, it is the colony or neo-colony which goes begging cup in hand for a reprieve and a new quarter. It is for this reason that a formerly colonized nation has no hope of developing until it breaks effectively with a vicious cycle of dependence and exploitation which characterizes imperialism. So we Africans, we African nations, and I'm talking about us as a collective because we are suffering the same exploitation, um, we must be willing to take the band-aid off and feel that pain and expose our wound so that it can heal. We must be willing to because we cannot keep asking the U.S. to keep putting that band-aid on us. Our wound will never heal. At the social and cultural level, there are many features which aid in keeping underdeveloped countries integrated into the capitalist system, and at the same time hanging on to the apron strings of the metropoles. The Christian church has always been a major instrument for cultural penetration and cultural dominance, in spite of the fact that, in many instances, Africans sought to set up independent churches. I have said this, I will say this, and every time I make some African feel certain way, and that's okay, your feelings are temporary, as opposed to us continuing being exploited, which is ongoing. So you will get over your feelings of hurt, which is a very, very less painful and harmful thing right now, and you will be thankful that we come to this realization. The Christian church has always been a major instrument. We're not talking about, for those of you who want to argue, we're not talking about the original Christian church in Ethiopia. That's not the point here. We're talking that, about the Christian church as ha, has, has been talked about and brought to us by the imperialists and the colonialists. That's the Christian church we're talking about, the missionaries who are currently in Africa. The Christian church has always been a major instrument for cultural penetration and cultural dominance in spite of the fact that in many instances, Africans sought to set up independent churches. Equally important has been the role of education in producing Africans to service the capitalist system and to subscribe to its values. Recently, the imperialists have been using new universities in Africa to keep themselves entrenched at the highest academic level. Give me a quick second, sorry. Um, I was very shocked this year when I went to look, and I should have known this as someone who um, is reading, but now I know because I'm reading, because I'm doing the research, now I know. To find U.S. universities in Africa, and universities that are here have buildings in Africa as if we cannot build our own universities. They do, they have them there. And if you think they're serving African interests, you're wrong. Something as basic as language has come to serve as one of the mechanisms of integration and dependence, which is why Nduko and others, and I thank you for the work that you're doing to help me, are teaching Kiswahili today. Um, I mean, currently. We're teaching Kiswahili so that we can liberate our tongues and we can stop being dependent on English. The French and English that are that are so widely used in Africa are, are more for the purpose of African communication with the, with the exploiters than for African with African. Actually, it would be difficult to find a sphere which did not reflect the economic dependence and structural inter integration. At a glance, nothing could be less harmful and more entertaining than music. And yet, this too is used as a weapon of cultural domination. You all see the influence um, of those who want to exploit us in our music as well. The songs that have the N-word, the songs that have the naked women, the songs that are showing disrespect of women, those are the songs that are making money. Those are the artists that are making money. 
And if they want to be nice and, and represent, be well-dressed like Jill Scott, like um, India Ari, like Erica Badu, if they want to cover up and be nice dressed, they're not, well, fortunately, they're making good money, but not Beyonce money, right? Beyonce's got to come, wear whatever she's wearing and shake around for her to be where she is. That's why she's where she is. And so that's how the capitalist system, no shade on you, Beyonce. I'm just, I'm not going for you. I'm going for the capitalist system that has created you, not you. So that capitalist system is telling us and our young girls that in order for you to make it, you gotta be like Beyonce, shake your booty. Don't be like Erica Badu and Jill Scott and Nina Simone. Don't cover up. That's not gonna make you money. And we think it's just music. The American imperialists go so far as to take the folk music, jazz, and soul music of oppressed black people and transform this into American propaganda over the voice of America beamed at Africa. During the colonial period, the forms of political subordination in Africa were obvious. There were governors, colonial officials, and police. In politically independent African states, the metropolitan capitalist Capital, capitalists have to ensure favorable political decision by remote control. So they set up their political puppets in many parts of Africa who shamelessly agree to compromise with the various apartheid regime of South Africa when their masters tell them to do so. The revolutionary writer Franz Fanon, I am sorry to bring this up South Africa, my South African brothers and sisters, but I've got to bring it up if we're going to be liberated. I have got to say the painful truth. You all wanting those white people to continue owning the land is a problem. You're compromising. And it's continuing that vicious cycle of exploitation. You all having that, uh, what was it called? Truth and reconciliation uh, committee? What was it called? Truth and reconciliation something. That's a problem. You're compromising with exploiters. In order for us to be liberated, there's no compromising with exploiters. That's a no-no. It's not just South Africa. The revolutionary writer Franz Fanon has dealt so scorchingly and at length with the question of the minority in Africa, which serves as the transmission line between the metropolitan capitalists and the dependencies in Africa. The importance of this group cannot be underestimated. The presence of a group of African sellouts is part of the definition of underdevelopment. Any diagnosis of underdevelopment in Africa will reveal not just low per capita income and protein deficiencies, but also the gentlemen who dance in Abidjan, Accra, and Kinshasa when music is played in Paris, London, and New York. Oh, Lord. Abarodni is coming for you all. Mm -mm. Political instability is manifesting itself in Africa as a chronic symptom of the underdevelopment of political life within the imperialist context. Military coups have followed one after the other, usually meaning nothing to the mass of the people, and sometimes representing a reactionary reversal of the efforts of national liberation. This trend was well exemplified in Latin America history so that its appearance in neocolonial South Vietnam or in neocolonial Africa is not at all surprising. If economic power is centered outside national African boundaries, then political and military power in any real sense is also centered outside until and unless the masses of peasants and workers are mobilized to offer an alternative to the system of sham political independence. All of those features are ramifications of underdevelopment and of the exploitation of the imperialist system. In most analysis of this question, they are either left out entirely or the whole concept of imperialism and neocolonialism is di dismissed as mere rhetoric, especially by academics. Yeah. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Yeah, there's no way for me to read this book without my interjections and observations and pain moments and just being pissed off and stopping and saying, I'm going to read this one more time. In most analysis of this question, 
they are either left out entirely or the whole concept of imperialism and neocolonialism is dismissed as mere rhetoric, especially by academics who claim to be removed from politics. I've been in those spaces where you called me or said I was just spewing rhetoric, told me I had a beautiful dream, but that's what it all was. And I'm sure I'm not the one you, you've said that to. But you are a problem. You academics, who tell those of us who want change now and who want to do something about it now are a problem. You all who say that what we're doing is politics and therefore we should stay away from it are a problem. So what if it's politics? Is this getting us to liberation? Good, let's get on the bus and drive ahead. You're a problem. I will read again why you're a problem. In most analysis of this question, what is the question? Let's go back to the question. I will start up at the top of that. We're almost done. We have one more, three more paragraphs. I will start at the top of political instability and I will not interject. Political instability is manifesting itself in Africa as a chronic symptom of the underdevelopment of political life within the imperialist context. Military coups have followed one after the other, usually meaning nothing to the mass of the people and sometimes representing a reactionary reversal of the efforts at national liberation. This trend was well exemplified in Latin America his American history, so that its appearance in neo-colonial South Vietnam or in neo-colonial Africa is not at all surprising. If economic power is centered outside national African boundaries, then political and military power in any real sense is also centered outside until and unless the masses of peasants and workers are mobilized to offer an alternative to the system of sham political independence. All of those features are ramifications of underdevelopment and of the exploitation of the imperialist system. In most analysis of this question, they are either left out entirely or the whole concept of imperialism and neocolonialism is dismissed as mere rhetoric, especially by academics who claim to be removed from politics. During the remainder of this study, a great deal of detail will be presented to indicate the grim reality behind the so-called slogans of capitalism, imperialism, col colonialism, neocolonialism, and the like. For the present moment, the position to be adopted can be stated briefly in the following terms. The question as to who and what is responsible for African develop underdevelopment can be answered at two levels. First, the answer is that the operation of the imperialist system bears more responsibility for African economic retardation by draining African wealth and by making it impossible to develop more rapidly the resources of the continent. Second, one has to deal with those who manipulate the system and those who are either agents or unwitting accomplices of the said system. The capitalists of Western Europe were the ones who actively extended their exploitation from inside Europe to cover the whole of Africa. In recent times, they were joined and to some extent replaced by capitalists from the United States. And for many years now, even the workers of those metropolitan countries have benefited from the exploitation and underdevelopment of Africa. None of these remarks are intended to remove the ultimate responsibility for development from the shoulders of Africans. Not only are there African accomplices inside the imperialist system, but every African has a responsibility to understand the system and work for its overthrow. That is chapter one. Thank you all for joining me. Next week we will do chapter two and moving on it will be just a chapter every time. And we all must reflect and see our role. I know my role. I'm working as best as I can to remove myself from the capitalist system. I'm urging my brothers, my African brothers, my African sisters 
and even non-Africans to stand in solidarity with this cause, with this mission. Let us slowly detach ourselves from Kamau, not slowly. Let us start very quickly, if possible tomorrow, but let us start detaching ourselves from capitalist systems. If you can get rid of it, I gave an example, the stock market. I don't care. They come for me. They want to say I'm terrorizing the United States. I'm preaching anti-American. The, the stock market is keeping us exploited. If that is anti-American, then so be it. The stock market is one way you can get out. And again, I said last week, I cannot keep succumbing to fear because I will be called a terrorist. I will be called anti-American. I am anti-American because the United States, as we see, is exploiting Africa, a place where I grew up, a place where my family is. And guess what? I don't just see myself as an individual. I spoke about Winnie Mandela yesterday. I see myself in her. I see myself in Mekatilili. I see myself in every African woman. I see myself even in African men. Which is why, for me, it's not just about my family. And which is why this is very personal for me. And so, yes, I am anti-American in that way. For as long as America is exploiting Africa, I am 100% no doubt anti-American. Um, I'm looking at the chat. I'm exhausted from reading, so we can't have a discussion right now. I just need a break to go drink water. I'm suggesting um, that maybe, because by the end of every reading, I'll be exhausted and I want some a break, that maybe we do another session on Kumbukeni, maybe on Tuesdays or another day of the week, um, where we can... Um, have a discussion and I invite you all to actually join me on stage, those who are interested. If you're interested in having a discussion on this, this week, whether tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, send me an email at kumbukeni1, I will put the email in the chat, one at gmail.com. My brothers are busy, which is why they're not with me, but if they are available, they will join us. Uh, if not, we can discuss. This is not just Nduko, Adisoji, and Milton's channel this is the community's channel and again we say we are decolonizing our minds not we are decolonizing your minds we're decolonizing our minds so i invite more people to join me in the discussion if you want to discuss this chapter the preface the introduction the forward uh and chapter one sometime this week let me know and i'll set up a a, a session for us to do that and I welcome those of you who want to come up on stage with me because the idea is to break down the ideas we just heard. What do we need to do? What do we need to call out? So that it's not just me calling out and we can unite uh, in this effort and reach our brothers and sisters. I thank you all for joining us. Asanteni, Kwaherini, Sikunjema, uh, and we'll see you on Monday, if not sometime again this week. We'll see you on Sunday. Definitely we'll be discuss discussing uh, the UN, since they just had their session, their annual session um, at the UN headquarters in New York. Kwaherini. <laughs>